Most people think my job is monotonous. I spend my day looking into the finance of businesses, nonprofit groups, government agencies, and wealthy businessmen. I'm a CPA and head of a group that does audits for a number of clients around town. Usually when the IRS is breathing down the company's respective necks, we get the call and spend anywhere from a few days to a few weeks making sense of their books. Most times it's rather cut and dry, but once in a while we find a surprise or two. Today I got the biggest surprise of my life. But the audit we were conducting didn't have anything to do with it, it had to do with what I saw outside the window. For the last three weeks my little team of investigators and I have been holed up in the offices of the Landmass Development Group pouring over just about the worst customer-built accounting system I've ever encountered. Landmass called us in because they're under investigation by the State Inspector General's Office for mismanagement of contracts and fraudulent invoicing of costs for several road and bridge construction projects. This is the second time the state has accused them of financial wrongdoing and the second time we've audited their books in an attempt to pull their butts out of the fire. However, this time I'm not sure we can perform the miracles they want. My team consists of three of the best computer people I've ever had the privilege to work with. Red is the informal leader of the group with Yin and Jackie taking point from time to time. The things they can do with computers are amazing and they can find the proverbial needle in a haystack no matter how deep the pile. We will put everything in Landmass Accounting Database under the microscope and match every transaction against company paperwork. My three geeks, as they call themselves, will find anything and everything questionable or out of line. Also in my group are two of the most tenacious accountants in the business, Adriana and Mandy. Both women have the attitude that the client's files are like their own children, theirs to do with as they see fit. Most of the time they're easygoing and pleasant, but whenever the situation calls for it, they can be downright ruthless. Don't lie to them or try to hide something from them and don't ever talk down to them. But hitting on them would be the worst thing anybody could do. Both are married and have loving families and anybody who thinks they would put that in jeopardy might just end up on the floor looking up at the ceiling. I've asked them to not break any arms or legs where a slap across the face would do, but I'll support them whatever happens. All five members of my team have earned my respect dozens of times over for their work ethic and their dedication to the job at hand. I expect them to make quick work of the client's mess. So, what do I do? I manage the work, interface with the client, and write up the final audit findings report. Yep, you're right. I sit on my but all day long looking like I'm doing something while my team does all the hard work. I wrap it all up at the end and give the client the bad news. I estimated landmass audit to take about three weeks. During our stay, we use lavish offices, each with windows that look out over the city, all the computer equipment we asked for, and even two secretaries to do our bidding. We even have our own coffee maker. I guess landmass management felt they had to be extra nice to us, so we got the best of everything. My office is at one end of the corridor on the 21st floor. Everybody else is at the other end. I got an office belonging to one of the managing partners who was on extended medical leave. It looked like something out of a 1930s movie. Dark wood paneling everywhere, lush carpet, bookshelves with all the great books, a giant antique globe, awards and plaques and trophies galore, a huge antique brass telescope, even a giant stuffed marlin. The mahogany desk and Edwardian chairs and leather couch reminded me of the furnishings of the Oval Office in the White House. It was all way over the top. I had a sense of how the landmass management spent their money. During one of my periods of inactivity my mind started to wander. I leaned back and started staring out the window. Across the street was another of the giant chrome and glass high-rise office buildings that dotted the business district. From my desk I couldn't make out any of the people in their offices. The glass had a shimmering surface that reflected the sunlight. I assumed if I couldn't see them then they couldn't see me either. I smiled. I smiled because I just realized that right across the street was the offices of Enterprise Research and Development. My wife Cheryl works for Enterprise as an account executive. I'd been in her office a number of times and got to know a lot of her co-workers. Most were pretty good people, but there were a couple I didn't like too much. But I didn't have to work with them, Cheryl did. Cheryl's office is on the 20th floor and just off to the left out my window. I got up and walked to the window to see if I could find her room. It took a few minutes to figure out which set of windows was hers, but even though I found them I couldn't make out anything on the other side of the glass. That's when I looked to my right and saw I was standing next to the giant brass telescope. I went to my door and closed it before returning to the telescope. After fiddling with its knobs for a couple minutes, I got it focused and found Cheryl's office. I could see her clearly now. I looked at the front of the instrument and saw a bluish filter that I assumed acted like a polarizing agent like those sunglasses that remove the glare from a sunny beach day. To the naked eye, the building's glass windows looked like shimmering gold mirrors. Looking through the telescope with the attached polarizing filter, 
They were just clear glass. I looked through it again and saw my vision of loveliness sitting at her desk staring at a computer monitor. There sat the most beautiful blonde-haired woman I've ever had the privilege to hold in my arms, the love of my life for the last nine years. After a couple more adjustments on the old scope, I was able to zoom in to where I could almost read the words displayed on her computer screen. I smiled again thinking how much industrial espionage occurred, just by looking over someone's shoulder as they worked. Maybe this was how Landmass got the drop on some of their competitors. Maybe I'd mention it to my team and see what they think, not that we can do anything about it. I zoomed back enough so that Cheryl's office windows filled the scope and stood there watching her work. My mind drifted to places and times other than where I was. I thought of Cheryl. I saw her clearly in my mind. I saw her standing beside our bed at home, smiling down at me with her wide, beautiful smile. I saw her clearly as she slowly removed her long black silk negligee, the one I bought her when we were in Paris last year. I saw her moving to the end of the bed wearing only black panties and black stockings smiling down at me, her blonde hair cascading down over her shoulders. I loved everything about Cheryl. There wasn't anything about her that wasn't perfect. Her sparkling blue eyes were perfect, her soft pale skin was perfect, her legs, belly, toes, everything about Cheryl's body was perfect. And everything inside Cheryl's body was equally as perfect. She was intelligent, funny, caring, honest, and best of all she loved me. But I think I loved her more. I stood there watching my wife work. Just looking at her and thinking about the times we made love made me anxious to get home. God, I loved that woman. My phone rang yanking me back to the boring real world of the landmass audit. I panicked momentarily thinking about the condition I was in, but knew no one would see me on the phone. Hello? Hey boss, said Mandy. You want to join us for lunch? Red found a little cafe across the street that might just turn out to be our new favorite place. How about it? Thanks Mandy, but I've got a number of phone calls to make. If you can bring me back a sandwich and a soda I'd appreciate it. Tuna salad would be good. Maybe tomorrow. Okay, just remember to come up for air once in a while and go home at a reasonable hour. No problem there. Thanks, Mandy. I exhaled. Looking around at my temporary desk, I saw nothing that couldn't wait until tomorrow. I went back to the telescope to look some more at my beautiful wife and fantasize about the good times. This time I saw she wasn't alone. Leaning against the edge of her desk was a man I remembered from their Christmas party, Brad something or another. He was one of the people I cataloged as someone I didn't like too much. He seemed to spend a lot more time with Cheryl than I was comfortable with. Cheryl just blew me off and said he was one of her bosses and she had to play up to him if she ever wanted to get ahead in the company. I wasn't happy but I didn't think any more about it. I watched for the longest time. I saw nothing but Cheryl talking to her boss. It looked like normal business activities so I didn't give it another thought. The man stood up and turned to leave. Cheryl leaned back in her chair and the man returned. I thought he was leaving but obviously he didn't. He only shut Cheryl's office door, dragged a chair over next to Cheryl and sat down. They were sitting side by side behind her desk when Cheryl lifted her feet and put them up on his knees. She had taken her shoes off. Her bare stocking feet folded over the man's knees. He reached down and picked up one foot and started massaging it. I could tell by how she let her head fall back on the back of her chair that she was really enjoying the foot rub. My heart started beating a little faster. I thought I was the only one who ever gave her a foot massage. Now I watched as one of her bosses ran his hands over them. He switched feet and rubbed and squeezed the other. Cheryl's head was still lying back on her chair. His hands moved from the feet to her ankle, and he continued the foot massage, but higher. Then he moved to her calf. I could see her long exquisite legs in the hands of a strange man and felt my heart speed up again. Now using both hands he rubbed both calves at the same time, occasionally lifting up her knees and sliding his hand under her thigh. Jesus Christ, what's going on? I said out loud. The man was now rubbing Cheryl's legs all the way up. He even moved her knees apart. From where he sat, he must have been able to see everything she had to offer. At no time did her head ever move. She looked like she was enjoying every bit of it. Suddenly she jumped and her head came up. She said something to the man and he looked to the side. When he turned back he was smiling, but at no time did he ever stop rubbing her legs. My heart was beating faster and faster. Cheryl scooted around in her chair and leaned back. I about blew a gasket. I pulled away from the telescope and started pacing the room. I didn't know what to do. My mind wasn't working but my heart was beating a mile a minute. Finally, I saw my cell phone on the desk and grabbed it. I returned to the telescope and saw that now Cheryl was leaning back in her chair with her skirt up around her hips. The look on his face was one of lust. I could just see Cheryl's face and she wore the biggest smile. 
I'd seen that smile a lot of times when we made love, and now she was smiling at some guy from her. I thought my heart would explode from my chest. I pressed Cheryl's office number on my cell phone's speed dial. Cheryl's head turned toward her phone, and I saw her reach to answer it. The man never slowed down. Hi honey, she said sweetly. This is a nice surprise. What's up? For a moment I was speechless. Here I was talking to my wife on my cell phone and watching through a telescope as she lay back in her chair. Her voice never gave a hint of anything going on. Honey, is everything okay? She asked when I couldn't make a sound. I just called to tell you how much I loved you. I finally managed to get out. Ah, uh, that's so sweet, she cooed. I love you too. Yeah, I was sitting here staring out the window and thought how much I missed you. I can't wait until tonight and have you in my arms again. Honey, that's so sweet. I can't wait to be with you too. Look, I'm a little busy at the moment. Can I call you back after lunch? Sure. Why don't you go back to what you were doing and call me when you're finished? Enjoy yourself. Bye. I watched as she hung up the phone. Then she did something I would have never in a million years expected. She raised her middle finger and pointed it at the phone. She was saying screw you to the phone and to me. She grabbed onto the arms of her chair and stiffened up. Her face displayed the climax she was experiencing at the hands of another man while I stood across the street watching like a perverted voyeur. My heart stopped beating. My world ended. The last thing I saw was Cheryl standing and straightening her skirt and kissing the man who just gave her a good time. I fell to the floor, at least I think I did, because when I opened my eyes again Mandy was kneeling at my side and looking down into my face. Boss, what happened? She asked, all worried. Adriana's calling 911. What's going on? I don't know, I mumbled. I think I passed out. I, I don't. You just lie there and relax, she interrupted. The paramedics will be here shortly. I closed my eyes and all I could see was Cheryl pointing her middle finger at the phone. I started to cry. I felt Mandy's hands holding mine, but still I cried. I couldn't stop. Sometime later I heard a commotion at the door and people talking. When I opened my eyes again I saw a fireman. He put a blood pressure cuff around my arm and pressed the button. He was listening to my heart beating and put an oxygen mask over my mouth and nose. He also did a number of emergency evaluation things that I'd only seen on television. Hello Mr. Hughes, can you tell me what happened? The fireman asked. I was just looking out the window and everything went black. Have you been under any stress or anything like that? Your blood pressure is extremely high. Well, yes, uh, no, I, how do you feel now? I couldn't tell him I felt like I wanted to die, so I lied. I'm okay. I guess I should have taken my doctor's advice and started taking that blood pressure medication. Sir, if you can sit up, I'll take your pressure again. He did. It was still high. After a couple minutes, I was able to maneuver over onto the couch, with help of course. I told the fireman I didn't want to go to the hospital. He took my blood pressure one more time and it was down, but still high normal. Sir, do you think you'll be okay now? I'll be fine. Thanks for coming. I'll just call my doctor and tell him what happened. Thanks for helping. They left. I relaxed on the couch with Mandy holding my hand the whole time. I forced myself to put on a brave face and smiled a little smile at Mandy. Are you going to be okay? She asked. I don't know. I think I'll just take the rest of the day off. I don't think so. From the other side of the room came the voice of authority, someone I've never disagreed with before. Adriana was standing by the window with her hands on her hips scowling at me. You're not going anywhere until you tell us the truth. We're your friends, Marty. Now spill. Red, Yin, and Jackie were standing around my desk looking concerned and a bit bewildered at what Adriana said. I, nothing happened. I just passed out, that's all. I, bullshit, Marty. Adriana yelled. Then she slowly lifted her hand up and pointed at the telescope. What did you see? All the sadness came rushing back. I started to hyperventilate. Marty, relax. Mandy whispered in my ear. Whatever it is, we're all here for you. It'll be all right. No, it won't, I mumbled. I started to break down again but fought hard to control my emotions. I started shaking. That's when I felt four arms around me. Adriana joined Mandy on the couch, trying to make my world whole again. I just sat there shaking and staring down at the floor. Red, get some ice and some bottled water. Maybe some sodas too, Adriana ordered. Yin, put the in-conference sign on the door. Jackie, get some extra chairs. We're going to have a team meeting. A few minutes later with the door closed my team, and I sat around in a circle with me on one side on the couch and Mandy and Adriana with their arms still around me. Mandy was pumping me full of ice water. Adriana leaned forward and turned my head to face her. 
She spoke softly, like you would to a child. Okay Marty, no bullshit this time. What did you see? I spilled my guts. I told them everything and didn't leave out a single disgusting detail. At the end I wanted to cry some more but was just too exhausted. I just sat on the couch looking down at my hands thinking about my totally destroyed life. What do you want to do Marty? Adriana asked using her gentle motherly voice. I thought for the longest time. I loved Cheryl with every bit of my being. I didn't want to lose her. Hell I would die if I did. But what I saw through the telescope was a game changer. Whatever I thought about Cheryl and our lives together. Specifically our marriage was now totally under review. Everything from the past was in question. I know what I saw and it hurt like hell. But what does it all mean? What's going on? I didn't know what to do without knowing everything about everything. I looked around at my team, my friends and started to talk. Guys, I've got a problem, a big problem, but don't want you to get involved. I blow it out your butt Marty. Jackie shot at me. My little emo girl computer geek stared back at me with her over dark eyes. I was never a fan of piercings and tattoos but Jackie convinced me over and over again that in spite of her arms filled with drawings of snakes and dragons, 12 earrings, a diamond stud in her nose, a gold ring in her eyebrow, and a gold bar through her tongue, and who knows how many others hidden elsewhere. She was by far the most rational and caring person I've ever met. I sat there stunned because she's never said anything stronger than, darn, the entire time I've known her. Marty, Jackie said looking me square in the eyes. We're a team. More than that we're friends. Friends don't let friends in trouble go it alone. We're going to help you. Whatever you want to do we'll do it. Short of murder that is. Mandy turned to me and said, she's right Marty. Right now you're hurting and probably feel like you want to die but the one thing I know for sure is that as long as you have friends you have hope. You will survive. Whatever you decide to do will be right beside you the whole way. We'll help you. You just need to lead us like you always do. Tell us what you want and we'll make it happen. Silence filled the room as I thought about what I wanted. The one thing I wanted, no needed most was to know how much trouble my marriage was in. I needed to know everything Cheryl was hiding from me. Then I could decide on a path. Until then I would have to suffer with the devastating images my mind conjured up. But the image of her middle finger pointing at the phone was devastating enough. I need to know, I said finally. I need to know everything. Who she's been with, how long, how many times, what she's done, everything. The one answer I need the most and probably won't ever get is why. Why did she do this to me? Is there something wrong with me? Something I can't give her? Don't start blaming yourself, Adriana said. You don't know if anything's your fault. For myself I can say for all the years I've known you, you've been the perfect gentleman and friend. I don't know what's going on but by God we're going to get to the bottom of it. And if it doesn't turn out like you want then you always have us to help you through it. We will always be there for you Marty. Guys, we need to make some plans. Mandy said to the group. Red, Yin, and Jackie, you three think of ways to find out anything from where she works. She's doing it there so we need to know more from that angle. Adriana and I will try to figure out the non-work related stuff. Brainstorm some ideas and let's get back together at 4 o'clock. Marty, you go down to my office and lie on the couch. I want you to relax. I want you away from that telescope for the rest of the day. You've seen enough. I'll have someone spot check things from here. I went to Mandy's office and laid down on the couch. All I could think about was Cheryl with her legs spread and some guy giving her a good time. Mostly the image of her giving the phone, and me, the scene I saw earlier, burned brightly in my mind. At 4 o'clock, Yin stuck her head in the room and said everyone was meeting in my office. I always liked Yin. She's always been a bit on the quiet side, but when she said something everyone took notice. For being only 24 years old, she had an aura of maturity about her that seemed way beyond her years. She also has an IQ way off the charts. Her Asian heritage gave her an enigmatic air that made her seem both becoming and approachable while at the same time aloof and mysterious. She took my hand and walked down the corridor with me. With everyone back in their original seats Adriana led the gathering and took notes. I thought it strange that she took notes about plans to invade my wife's privacy and open up her hidden side, but I didn't say anything. Mostly everybody talked around me. I just sat and listened. When the meeting was over and the plan formulated, each person went off to do the tasks assigned, just like any of the audits we've done in the past. All I had to do was what I usually did, sit down and look busy and give up my credit card for supplies. Marty, can you go home tonight? Mandy asked. I don't think I can face her. I mumbled through my fingers. I think I'll just stay here until after she goes to bed and then crawl home. Hopefully I won't have to talk her tonight. I can't trust myself. I might say something I don't want to. Can you go out of town on a business trip? She asked. 
Maybe, I'll have to think about it. I don't want to be around her this weekend, so I'll have to come up with some excuse to be out of the house. Maybe my father can have an accident or something. I'll think about it and let you know. If you need a place to stay for a few days, you can always come over to my house. We've got a guest room you can use. I'll tell Aaron and the kids and warn them you might be visiting. I stared through the telescope at an empty office for the longest time. The whole movie played over and over in my head, allowing me to relive the pain multiple times. I left the office after 9 and drove the long way home arriving home after 10. Luckily Cheryl was already asleep. As quietly as I could I got my clothes ready for the next day and took a shower. Cheryl never moved. I guess she was tired from all the activities at the office today. I went to the guest room and pulled the covers over my head. I was up before dawn and on the road before Cheryl awoke. I couldn't face her knowing what I knew. I just had to figure out how to survive. I arrived at my landmass office before everyone and put on a pot of coffee. Once in my office, I looked at the telescope like it was a demon. I was afraid to go near it. Around 9 o'clock I wandered down the hall to see what my team was up to. Yin was at her computer doing something that I didn't understand. She smiled at me when I poked my head in the door. Where is everybody? I asked. Getting ready, she said with a smile turning back to her computer. Inscrutable those Asians, I thought walking back to my desk. Just after 10 o'clock, Red came into the office pushing several large boxes on a dolly. I watched as he said about his work without a single word to me. Red is a walking contradiction. To look at him you would see a tall, red-headed string bean of a man, freckly face with out-of-date glasses. He looked like every stereotypical geek we've ever met wearing a Star Trek shirt. He often wore a Star Trek shirt and an Indiana Jones fedora but that was only part of his charm. Away from the office he was anything but a geek. I heard he was an avid mountain climber whose goal was to one day hike Mount Everest. He also sped around the countryside on his two-year-old Ducati motorcycle. Red may look like a geek, but in his heart he was an adventurer. When he realized I was sitting there he waved at me and set about opening the boxes and setting up the equipment. It turned out to be another telescope, but this one was more modern, and instead of looking through the eyepiece you looked at a computer monitor. The resolution was better too. When he focused it on Cheryl's computer, I could clearly read everything on the screen. She was working on her email. It didn't contain anything important, just enterprise business. Without ever looking up, Red spoke from the computer console attached to the telescope. As soon as Yin gets finished her side of things, we won't need to look through the window to see what's on your wife's computer. By this afternoon, we'll be firmly entrenched in their server network and have access to everything they have. We'll be able to snoop around and look for things as well as control any and every computer they have. We can copy all of their incoming and outgoing traffic as well. You may not know this, but Yin was the best hacker UCLA ever produced. Red busied himself with setting up another computer with a giant 60-inch monitor. He didn't say what the large screen's purpose was, but I had my suspicions. Just before he left, he placed a big red button on my desk and stood there smiling. Press it, he said. When I did all of the computer screens around the room flashed to show diagrams and spreadsheets of landmass computer systems and their accounting systems. If anybody comes in who doesn't know what we're doing, like landmass management, just press the red button and everything changes over to what you see now. It's like a screensaver, but with landmass data on the displays. It's all bullshit, but it'll look like we're doing the audit we're supposed to be doing. He smiled and left. Adriana and Mandy showed up just before lunch and sat down at the telescope computer. They maneuvered the telescope around and had a great view of Cheryl's office on the display. A few minutes later a man walked into the office. It wasn't the same man as the day before. This guy was older and had white hair and a considerable paunch. I just watched the screen hoping upon hope that he wasn't there for the same foot massage. Mandy looked over at me. Marty, maybe you should go down to my office for a little while, she said with concern in her voice. You might not want to watch if things happen like yesterday. I don't want your blood pressure to go through the roof again. I didn't say a word. I just got up and left the room. An hour later Mandy came in the room and sat down beside me at her computer where I was playing blackjack. She put her arms around my chest and her head on my shoulder. I could tell she was hurting. Mandy, I both don't want to know and I need to know. Did anything happen? Mandy nodded her head, yes, against my shoulder. My heart was starting to beat faster and the pain returned. But I had to know. What? I asked quietly. She sniffed and sat up looking at me. I could tell making eye contact was difficult for her. She sniffed again and then softly said, BJ. It was like someone hit me in the chest with a hammer. One word and I was a quivering mass again. One simple word. Marty. We recorded everything. Red set everything up so we can record what goes on in case you need it in the future, maybe for a lawyer or something. I suggest you don't watch it. 
It'll only hurt you more than you already are. Come on, let's get you something to drink. Mandy took my hand and guided me back to my office, now resembling more of a modern-day war room than a 1930s mausoleum. The big 60-inch monitor now displayed 40 different smaller screens showing corridors, offices, doorways, and the like. I just stood there staring. That's a display of the security cameras on the 20th through the 24th floors across the street, Yen said coming up beside me. We can see just about everywhere in their offices, everywhere except the bathrooms, and a number of the upper manager's offices. And we can control everything from this monitor, zooming in on one particular camera or series of cameras. We can even record everything, or just selected cameras. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, yeah, I said not knowing what else to say. Come look at this boss, Red said from the other side of the room. I went over and stood behind him. He was sitting back with his arms crossed smiling. You're watching your wife working on her computer. This is a slave attached to her system, and when her computer is turned on we can see everything she does. Right now she's writing someone requesting the cost of the microchips used in their robotic control arms. No biggie. As we watch this I'm downloading every email she either sent or received in the last five years. She keeps her schedule on her computer and has it synced up with her smartphone. I haven't looked at it yet, but it might be important later on so I copied it over too. I can do the same thing to any computer they have over there. Their security sucks big time. I went back over to my desk and sat down not knowing what else to do. A few minutes later my cell phone rang. Shush, everybody quiet, Red yelled. Go on boss. Hello? Hi honey, it's me, Cheryl said. I immediately moved over to the telescope monitor console and saw Cheryl sitting at her desk holding the phone to her ear. She was alone. Hey there, what's up? You worked pretty late last night. I didn't have a chance to cuddle up next to you in bed. I was just calling to tell you how much I missed you. Are you going to be late again tonight? I couldn't face her yet. My head was still swimming with thoughts about what was going on, how long, what she did, and the like. I had to lie to her, just like she's been lying to me. Probably. This audit is turning out to be a real bear. We've got an incredibly short deadline, and it's going to take a lot of work to make it. Everybody's working there but off around here. And, to top it all off I got a call from my father. He's having some problems with his plumbing again. I might have to go up there this weekend and snake out his pipes. Sorry. Oh well, I was hoping for a little one-on-one -on -one time with you tonight. I bought a new outfit last weekend and haven't had a chance to try it out. I was going to dress up this weekend and let you be the first to do the undressing. It's everything I know that turns you on. It's sheer but looks like your average little black dress, short as hell with a plunging neckline down to my navel, and it only takes one finger to unsnap it so it falls around my ankles. I also bought a matching black thong from Victoria's Secret. Oh well, your loss. Maybe next weekend. Sounds nice. Sorry I'm going to miss it. Maybe next weekend we can plan on going somewhere special to show it off. Absolutely not. It's not something I'd ever wear in public. It's just for you. For your eyes only. Okay. I got it. I tell you what. Why don't you go ahead and make reservations at the Hyatt for next weekend and we'll go and pamper ourselves at the spa and have dinner at the Sorbonne Steakhouse. Afterwards, I can unwrap my present. Ooh, that sounds nice. I'll see if I can make reservations for one of their suites. I want to try something with you in the jacuzzi that I read about in a magazine. It has to do with the water jets. It sounded yummy. I'm looking forward to it. I'll make sure everything I have to do is done by next Friday, and I'll call you from my father's to let you know when I'll be home. Okay, sounds like a plan. Love you. Bye. Bye. I couldn't make myself say love you back. I watched as she put the phone back in its cradle, but this time, she didn't give the phone the finger. What was different about this phone call I wondered. Then it hit me, she wasn't with somebody, she wasn't having sex with somebody. What did all that mean? Tada! Jackie stood in the doorway with her hands above her head, like she just kicked the game-winning field goal in the Super Bowl. Somebody bring up the second camera partition. Here boss, catch. She tossed something my way, and instinctively I reached out and caught it. It was my keys. What are you doing with my keys? I asked. Just got finished wiring your house for pictures and sound. Anything that goes on there will be recorded here. She stood pointing at a computer monitor that displayed my kitchen. Every room in your house, including your bathroom, has a camera in it. Neat, huh? Yeah, neat, I replied sadly. Everybody worked at various computers for the rest of the day. I guess they were dividing their time between monitoring Cheryl and getting the audit done. At least I hoped they were working on the audit. One by one they said goodnight and disappeared out the door. The last one to leave was Mandy. Listen Marty, go out and get something to eat, she said standing in front of my desk. Don't drink too much, but do whatever you need to do to get your mind off of everything. Maybe take in a movie. 
Tomorrow's Friday, and I'll be in here early to finish up my part of the audit. Get away from here this weekend and think about what you want to do. We'll all get together Monday and talk. Just remember, you aren't in this by yourself, you have friends. Good night. When she left I sat and thought. I considered all the options. I even wrote the possible ways of handling the situation on a piece of paper and the pros and cons of each. I wanted to handle it like every other audit I've ever done but the emotional baggage was just too much. In the end I left the paper on the desk and left. I got home at midnight. I took Mandy's advice and went out and had a nice dinner, but I wasted my money. I just couldn't eat all of the steak I ordered. When I got home Cheryl was asleep again, so I gathered up clothes for Friday and the weekend, showered quietly, and slept in the guest bedroom. Again I was out of the house before she woke in the morning. Trying to avoid the woman who had been my whole life up until two days ago was difficult, both physically and emotionally. I watched Cheryl come into her office through the telescope. She had her usual coffee and bagel, and the first thing she did was look at her daily schedule. I could see clearly marked at noon the words, all four. I hadn't a clue what that meant, but knew it wasn't good. For the last two days at lunchtime, she'd had sex with one of her co-workers so whatever all four meant probably signaled the end of my marriage. Today I decided to endure the pain and watch whatever she had planned, in spite of the objections of my team. I got the team together for a few minutes when the last one straggled in. Guys, I've got to talk to you. I started off the meeting. I can't take this much longer so I've made a couple decisions. Decisions are what I'm supposed to do around here so I'm trying to earn my pay. First, regardless of what goes on over there today, I'm going to sit at the monitor and watch. I would prefer to be alone because I might not handle it very well, but I also don't want you calling 911 for me again. So, decide which one of you will babysit me during lunch. Second, this weekend I'm going to come to grips with everything and decide on a course of action. Right now it's not looking too good for Cheryl and me, but I don't know exactly what I want to do. Whatever it is I may need your help. You offered so I'm taking you up on it. But if the shit hits the fan I want you as far away from me as possible. There's no way you're going to get hurt by the fallout of my marriage. There's no discussion on this. This is how it's going to be. Third, I want the audit to be finished by next Friday and every bit of this equipment out of here. Everybody went back to their desks and left me alone. Every so often I'd look up at the telescope monitor to see what Cheryl was doing. The closer to noon it got the more nervous I got. When I looked up around 11.30 she was gone. Marty, I'm here to be your babysitter, Mandy said as she closed and locked my door. Everybody wanted to do it, but I shouted the loudest. Everybody's here for you, in spirit. It made my heart feel good knowing there were people out there that would go the extra mile to help a friend. I only hope I could be as good a friend should they ever need me. I looked up when I saw movement on the telescope monitor and saw Cheryl come back into view. However, she had changed her clothes. She was now wearing the little black dress she described to me over the phone yesterday. She was right too. It was absolutely stunning and something I wouldn't want her to wear out in public. Her long blonde hair cascaded down her shoulders, covering the top of the dress where it went behind her neck. It was a halter top style that attached behind her head with two pieces of material that went down from each side, joining at her navel and the dress was as short as she said. It came to about mid-thigh, and was sheer enough to see the outline of the thong she wore underneath. The thong had to be the one she got from Victoria's Secret. She said the outfit was for me, but she lied again. She was wearing it for a co-worker. Mandy reached over, and took my hand in hers. I could feel her tremble as we sat there watching Cheryl primping, and brushing her hair, waiting. Waiting for whom? Who was she going to have sex with this time? All at once Cheryl turned toward her office door. All we could see was the back of her now, but I could tell by her body language that she enjoyed what she saw. She held her arms out greeting her lover. As I watched in shock she put her arms around one man. The man who gave her a good time the other day, and gave him a passionate kiss. Another man came into view, and when the two lovers broke their kiss she wrapped her arms around the second man's neck and kissed him. Then a third appeared waiting his turn in Cheryl's arms. And then a fourth. Now I knew the meaning of all four in her appointment book. I sat there watching my wife, and the woman I love, kissing four of her co-workers. The one with the paunch and white hair is the man she was with yesterday, Mandy whispered. I didn't see them together but the word Mandy used burned brightly and permanently in my mind. We sat and watched. The four men stood in a circle around Cheryl, and they all talked and laughed. Cheryl would touch the men on their arms, or their chest as they talked. She was the center of attention and really enjoying herself. And so did her entourage. All at once the four men sat down around the room, two on the couch against the far wall and two in office chairs facing her desk. They all turned slightly to where Cheryl was standing, in the corner next to the window. 
From where the telescope was mounted, there was an excellent view of everybody and everything going on over there. Cheryl started to sway. She was moving to music that I couldn't hear. Cheryl's a good dancer, and this wasn't the first time I'd seen her dancing solo. She did it for me when she wanted to turn me on just before jumping in bed on top of me. And she did turn me on. I watched as she danced around the room and in front of each member of her audience. She dipped and swayed and ran her fingers across the shoulders of the men as she passed close to them. Watching her move around like that would normally get me excited but watching her now, in front of an audience of her co-workers, had the opposite effect. Slowly she swayed around until she was back in the corner where she started. She reached up under her hair and behind her neck. The two straps of the halter top collapsed in front and with a simple wiggle of her hips the dress fell to the floor around her feet. With a smile and a shimmy she danced through the seated men. This time they reached out and ran their hands over her body. At each touch I flinched. Mandy held my hand as tight as she could without cutting of circulation. Cheryl stopped. She stood in the middle of the men and looked at each one smiling. Her hands moved over her body. Her smile was radiant. It just about crushed the life out of me. They started to have sex. I needed a break. My reality needed to rest. Mandy stroked my back and whispered, It's okay. It'll be over soon. When I turned back, I saw the grimace on the face of the man who was now having sex with my wife. I saw them all one by one. I felt Mandy's arms around my shoulders. When I turned to look at her she was facing away from the monitor and crying. She was crying for me. I looked back at the screen and saw Cheryl bending over to pick up her dress. The men had their pants back on and were heading for the door. Cheryl then opened a desk drawer, pulled out a towel, and started wiping her body. When she came back, she was dressed in her usual business outfit and stuffing her little black dress into a dress bag. Five minutes later she was back at her computer reviewing her emails like nothing had happened. But something had happened. Our marriage had died. My heart was beating fast but not enough to shoot my blood pressure through the roof. I was surprisingly calm. Maybe I already knew what I was going to do. I became aware of Mandy's soft sobs on my shoulder again. It's all over Mandy, I said quietly. She sat up and looked at the monitor and then at me. How are you doing? She asked. Not too good, but a hell of a lot better than the other day. I'm pretty numb right now. I think I'm going to have a pretty bad weekend once it all sinks in. What can I do? I don't know. I'm definitely not going home. I'll drive up to my father's place and talk with him. He's always had a pretty rational way of looking at things. Maybe he can give me some advice? Well, remember I'm here for you. We all are. Just ask. Thanks, Mandy. I appreciate it. And if I don't say anything to anybody else today, thank them for me too. I will. Mandy left me alone with my thoughts. A few minutes later Red came in and sat down at one of the computers. He didn't make eye contact with me. I guess Mandy told him what went on. A half hour later four pictures appeared on the large 60-inch monitor. Beneath them was an organizational chart of the Enterprise Research and Development Corporation. I thought you'd like to know. These are the four guys. They are all your wife's immediate supervisors. They're two levels down from the top echelon management and have direct control over her work. I have their personnel files if you want them. In another hour, I'll know everything about their lives, finances, family, everything. I'll put everything in a file on your computer for you. I never said a word. Red continued working in silence, and I sat there looking at the faces of the four men who screwed my wife. I can't blame them though. Any man in his right mind would want to have Cheryl. Anybody but me that is. I was no longer in my right mind. Adriana was the last to leave and stopped by to see if I was okay. She heard the details about Cheryl's lunchtime session and spoke softly as she wished me well for the weekend. When I was alone again the pain started in earnest. Tears forced their way out of my eyes and onto the desk top. I had to get away and think. I looked at the telescope monitor and saw Cheryl packing up her desk. She stuffed the dress bag with her little black dress in a plastic bag. I picked up the phone and dialed home leaving Cheryl a message that I was going to my father's for the weekend. I then called my dad and asked if he wanted a visitor for the weekend. I don't know how he did it, but he sensed something was wrong and said to come ahead. Fifteen minutes later I was on the road. Monday morning I walked into the offices of the Landmass Development Group with more energy and sense of purpose than I had in several days. My dad is a wise man and helped me to figure out what I wanted to do. He didn't tell me what to do. He just helped me navigate the currents of the ocean I was drowning in. I made up my mind. I knew what had to happen. Now I needed my team to make things work. Jackie walked up to where I was making coffee and stood watching me. You okay, boss? She asked, her black eyes staring holes through me. I'm okay. Thanks for asking. Without saying another word, she put her arms around me and gave me a giant hug. 
I felt the rings and studs of one ear digging in my chest. I didn't say a word. I just enjoyed the moment. Am I disturbing anything? Yin said from the door. We broke apart, acting startled and guilty. We walked away and smiled at the little Asian woman. She smiled back, her beautiful smile lighting up the room. She reached out for my hand as I passed and escorted me to my office. When Red showed up I asked him to gather the forces. I wanted to have a council of war. His smile was from ear to ear. Everybody gathered again in my office, with the in-conference sign on the door. Guys, I've come to a decision. Actually I had a lot of help making up my mind. My father. Anyway here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see a lawyer today, and start the divorce process. I'm going to have the papers served at her office at lunchtime as soon as they're ready. Hopefully, the process server will interrupt one of her little trysts. Then I'm going to call her and let her know that I've been watching everything she's been doing. I'm going to tell her that she has a choice to make. Me or her lovers. If she chooses me then she needs to do three things. File a sexual harassment suit naming her four supervisors and the management of her company. She has to resign. And finally I'm going to ask her to explain why she did this to me. If she does everything I ask, without hesitation, I'll put the divorce on hold and see if we can work things out. I'm not sure we can after what I've seen but I'll give us a chance. If she doesn't do any of the three things then I'm going to send out an email barrage to everybody in enterprise research and development containing short videos of her activities. Also the wives of her four supervisors will get the videos and an offer of the raw footage. I know it's vindictive but I need to do something. Anything to let those men know they can't take advantage of Cheryl and me. I need for them to feel some of the pain I feel. Maybe revenge isn't right but I don't care right now. Now you guys need to get all this spy equipment out of here and out of my house and get out of their systems. I don't want to leave any trace that we were there. Pack up everything and get it out of here tonight. And anything that pertains to Cheryl, pack up separately and give it all to Adriana to hold for me. Keep backups, but don't keep anything that will get you in trouble. But before you do all that I need some help with the emails should it come to that. Red, can you do that for me? Already done boss. I'll set it up on your computer so it's untraceable back to you. With the push of a button, the building across the street will implode from everybody simultaneously sucking in a breath when they see it. Let's not get overly dramatic there, Red, I said smiling. I just want a nice neat nuclear strike and pray that I don't have to use it. A boss, said Red sheepishly. I might have some more information for you about what's been going on over there. Do you want it now or later in private? Shoot, everyone here knows everything else so a little more isn't going to matter. Go ahead. I'm pretty sure I know when this all started and why. I went over your wife's emails for the last year and found one that says that she's in line for a major promotion when one of the managers retires this coming spring. It's from one of her bosses, Brad Paxton. When I looked at her calendar for the days after that email I see Paxton's name on her calendar at lunch every Wednesday. Boss, I think she's been having sex with her boss as a way of guaranteeing the promotion. It seemed to have started last October. In December, another of the manager's names shows up on her lunchtime schedule, but on Thursdays. That one's the old fat guy. I'm only guessing here but I think somehow the old fat guy found out what they were doing and threatened to blow the whistle if he wasn't included. I found an email from him with a thinly veiled threat to that effect. Then in January, a third manager's name appears on the schedule on Tuesdays and the fourth on Mondays starting in April. Once a month she has them all together on Friday, like you witnessed last week. She doesn't appear to be involved with any other managers or co-workers, just these four. Her weekly lunch schedule's full up now, and there aren't any other managers anyway. I copied all the pertinent emails to your computer along with her calendar. Oh, and you should know there wasn't any activity at your home over the weekend. She spent a quiet couple days lounging around the house, reading, took a long bath, and did some sunbathing. I think she's only messing around at work. Just thought you needed to know. Thanks, Red. I said trying to fit the new pieces of information into what I already knew. I appreciate your diligence, all of you. I also appreciate your being there for me and your friendship. I'll never forget it. Everybody gave me the best present. They smiled at me. I looked back at my friends and smiled back. Okay, gang, let's get busy. And I want everything on the landmass audit on my desk by 5 o'clock today. Oh, and team, I'm going home this afternoon to get some things. I'm going to need somebody to keep an eye across the street and call me if she leaves the building. I'll let you all know where I'm staying as soon as I get situated. No. Both Mandy and Adriana said at the same time. Mandy scowled and turned to Adriana and put a finger in her face and said, No. I already told you Marty that you can stay in our guest room. I've even changed the sheets in there. As soon as you get what you want from your house you'll be staying with us. Don't argue with me. That's what's going to happen. Okay. I know when not to argue. 
I'll call you when I'm finished and get directions. The meeting ended, and everyone scattered. Red sat at one computer setting up my nuclear email bomb. Yin and Jackie started dismantling and boxing up the equipment around the room, all except the telescope and the computer monitor. We were going to need that when the shit hits the fan. Mandy and Adriana went to the other office and started gathering all of the landmass paperwork. I'm afraid our original estimate was right. We weren't going to be able to pull landmass collective asses out of the fire this time. I found a divorce attorney near our house and made an appointment for that afternoon. At lunchtime Adriana came to where I was sitting in Yan's office and handed me my cell phone. I didn't want to be anywhere near the telescope monitor during lunchtime. I'd already seen too much. Marty called Cheryl. We need you to call to see if she acts the same way she did last time after you hang up. We need a video of it. Sadly I took the phone and pressed her office number on speed dial. When she answered she sounded winded, like she had just run back to pick up the phone, but I knew that's not what she did. In my imagination I saw her lying back on her desk and having sex with one of her lovers. I didn't need to see it. My imagination conjured up enough painful images. When we hung up I looked over at Adriana who was standing just outside the doorway looking down the hall. She waved down the hall toward my office and then turned toward me. Thanks boss, we got it, she said. Did she? I asked sheepishly. Adriana just nodded and walked away. Monday and Tuesday night I stayed late at work and successfully avoided Cheryl at home. Wednesday at 12.15 p.m. was the scheduled time for everything to happen. I spent Tuesday preparing the final report to Landmass about their financial situation. I needed the office space for another couple days, so I just set the report on my desk until I finished what I had to do. Red told me he figured out a way to unlock Cheryl's office door remotely. You see, every door in their offices has an electronic lock. Every employee has a microchip in their ID, badge, and they wave it at the door lock to open any door. To lock a door once they're inside they press the lock slash unlock button. There's a little light next to each door handle. Locked doors display red, unlocked doors green. One of their computers controls who has access to which rooms and logs all entries and exits. And guess who now controls that computer? At the proper time, I'll unlock her door and then, well, you know what happens next. He was rather proud of himself, so much so he smiled. Smiling isn't something Red did too often. Wednesday morning was quiet and particularly solemn. We all met for a late breakfast and then adjourned to the quiet of my temporary office at Landmass. Exactly at noon Cheryl's lover showed up. It was the Brad fellow who I saw with Cheryl that first day. We all sat around the telescope monitor and watched as they talked for a while and then started to get down to business. Cheryl was going to get more than a foot rub this time. I was getting nervous and worried that the process server wouldn't show up on time. As we watched, the two lovers suddenly jerked their heads toward the door and frantically started getting their clothes back in place. A man in a suit came into view and stood in front of the desk. He said something we couldn't hear, but we all knew what he was saying, and then he held out a large manila envelope. Cheryl took it, and he turned and walked away. Cheryl sat down heavily in her chair while Brad just stood there looking stupid. We watched as she pulled out the papers and stared at them. Brad tried to take the papers from her, but she pulled back and everything flew all over her desk. They scattered around with the photos landing face up. Gingerly, she picked up one picture in each hand and looked at them. One picture showed her extending her middle finger at the telephone. The other showed her bent over her desk with the old man. Her head snapped around looking out the window. She ran to the window, placing her palms on the glass looking across at our building. I could clearly see the expression on her face. It was utter terror. She was busted and she knew it. She also knew her world had just changed, and not for the better. I pressed Cheryl's office number on my cell phone speed dial. When it rang she turned and looked at her phone like it was a rattlesnake, shaking its rattle at her. Slowly she moved to the phone and picked it up. Her answer was almost a sob. Hello? I said with a growl. Tell Brad to leave. She fell back down in her chair. She sat quietly with her chin on her chest for a long while before regaining her composure. Over the phone I heard her say, Brad, go away. It's my husband. He started to argue with her when she jumped up and screamed at him. Just get out. He knows all about us a-hole. If I were you, I'd get out of here and run as far away as I could. Marty may be an accountant, but he can kick your butt from here to Sunday. Now get out. I waited until I saw him leave. Cheryl sat back down and turned her chair to face the window. Cheryl, you have to listen carefully and do exactly what I say, I said. No arguments, no hesitation. You get one chance and one chance only. Do you understand? Through her tears she said, yes, I understand. I'm not messing around here, Cheryl. You get only one chance to save everything. Are you sure you understand? Yes, she whimpered. Good, now this is what's going to happen. 
First, you're going to quit your job. Second, you're going to file a sexual harassment lawsuit against each of your four lovers and against Enterprise as a whole. Third, you're going to explain to me why. Five minutes to do the first part. I saw her freeze and her empty hand move up to cover her mouth. I also heard the sobbing on the other end of the phone line. I reached over to my computer with my hand hovering over the Enter key. Once I pressed Enter, everybody at Enterprise and the wives of a certain four managers were going to receive the video of her activities. I hated to do it, but I would. I allowed her to compose herself and waited for an answer. I waited for a long time with my hand in mid-air. The first words I heard over the phone were, but Marty, I've got a lot invested in Enterprise. I'm going to be. I pressed Enter. I also pressed Off on my phone. Okay, guys, I said. Let's get the rest of this equipment out of here and go home. Take the rest of the day off. I've got a meeting with Landmass Top Man to give him the bad news at 2. Go home, and I'll see you back at the office tomorrow. I glanced over at the telescope's display and saw Cheryl screaming and banging on the glass of her office window. Red reached down and turned off the display putting me out of my misery, but I couldn't stop staring at the blank screen. Before I could do or say anything else all five of my group, my team of expert accountants, my computer geeks, my best friends in the entire world, came over and put their arms around me. Even Red. Everybody understood what just happened and shared in my sadness. I never felt more love and compassion from anyone else in my entire life like I did just then. I had the best group of friends in the world and knew that with them by my side I could weather any storm. I unchained my emotions and let the tears fall. Now let's check Cheryl's side of the story. For the last year my life has been shit. I did it. It's my fault. There's nobody to blame except me. I totally messed up everything. I messed up my marriage. I messed up my career. I even messed up my mind. There isn't a chance in hell I'll ever get any of it back, but I've made up my mind that I'm going to try. Exactly one year ago today a man showed up in my office while I was having sex with my boss. I have no idea how he got in because I was positive I locked the door, but there he was standing on the other side of the desk watching us. Brad and I jumped around like crazy people getting everything back in our clothes as he stood there with a stupid smirk. I distinctly remember yelling at him, Who the hell are you and what do you want? He just smiled and asked me if I was Cheryl Hughes. I yelled again, That's what it says on the door. Of course I'm Cheryl, now what do you want? He pulled a large manila envelope out from under his coat, held it out toward me and said in the calmest voice ever, Madam, you are served. That's the moment my life went to shit. I've lived every moment since then in a fog, everything before then only a painful memory, everything after that a blur. Only in the last couple months has my mind worked well enough to understand everything that happened. Thanks to a very sympathetic therapist, I now know, and better yet understand, what caused my life to be as messed up as it is. Now I'm going to go over every agonizing moment of what led up to that pivotal moment to make sure I haven't missed something important. If I'm going to try to restart my life, I have to understand why I did what I did. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain. We've just received permission to taxi out to the runway and get in line for our departure. There are three flights ahead of us, so while we're waiting our turn, we'll start the pre-flight briefing video. Again, we'd like to thank you for flying Delta for your trip to Boston today. The video monitor above the aisle came alive. All carry-on items should now be stored securely. Blah, blah, blah. I've heard there can speech a thousand times. I've only got two hours to go over everything before we land, and I'm not going to waste any time with something I've heard before. I know the routine. Now let's see. I've got to start where all tragic stories start, at the beginning. But where actually is the beginning? Did it start when I was born, or when I got married, or when I started at Enterprise, or maybe it was the day I learned about my promotion? If my therapist is right, everything started in my childhood. But I don't need to go back that far to review the events that led up to my running away from my husband, now ex-husband, and my former home. I need to start when I made the decision to cheat on him. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a cloudy Friday in October when my supervisor Brad Paxton called me into his office just before lunch. He said he had some good news for me. Cheryl, come on in and close the door, Brad said with a big smile. I sat in the chair facing his desk waiting for him to finish typing something into his computer reminiscing about my time at Enterprise. I'd been working at Enterprise Research and Development and for Brad for eight years as one of a number of account executives. My job has been to coordinate all of the processes, tasks, technical documents, and contractor interactions that Brad and the other three supervisors negotiated with 50 or so of our suppliers and in-product clients. I'm good at my job and after the first year felt confident enough in what I did that I thought I could do anything. I was even cocky enough to believe that I could do any of my supervisor's jobs, 
and sometimes better than they did. I have the education and the prior work experience to handle their jobs, it's just that moving into management at Enterprise is like trying to break through a brick wall with a marshmallow, especially for women. I've set my sights on being the first female supervisor at Enterprise and nothing was going to stand in my way. There's still a lot of the old boy network to break through. In spite of all that I get along with everybody from the office errand boy to the CEO, and I'm sure everybody likes me too. Cheryl, I think I may have some good news for you, Brad said sitting back in his huge executive chair. What I'm about to tell you is in strictest confidence. Please don't repeat anything I'm about to say. Okay, here goes. Ambrose St. John told the board on Wednesday that he intends to retire next May. That's going to leave a vacancy for a line supervisor position in logistics. It's fallen to me to make a recommendation for his replacement. Right now I've got a number of qualified people who could fill his shoes but I have in my mind only one, you. Your work has been exemplary, your attitude exceptional, and your knowledge of enterprises' procedures and contacts beyond what your current position demands. In short, you're a very qualified candidate for the job. But there are several others equally qualified candidates. Some have more seniority than you. Now I just can't give it to you and bypass everybody else. I have to post it and interview everybody who makes it through HR. But in the end, it still comes down to my decision. Cheryl, I think you would do a great job. It's just that I can't tell how much you really want to move up in the company. How strong is your ambition? What would you do to show me you really want the supervisor's position? Mr. Paxton, I've worked hard since I've been here to learn everything about everything. There isn't anything I haven't done, no area I don't have experience with, I've even filled in for you when you were on leave, and frankly I've been able to handle everything with ease. I'm more than ready for a bigger challenge now, and the supervisor's position would be ideal. What can I do to prove to you that I really am the perfect candidate for the job? I've been thinking about that, he said with the same big smile. I was thinking about getting away from the office where we can spend some time discussing what would be a good way for you to prove yourself. How about over lunch? I have an opening next Wednesday. How about we meet at La Chateau at, say noon on Wednesday? That way we can relax and be ourselves and talk frankly. And I'll pick up the tab too. I don't see any harm in that, I said smiling back at him. Is there anything you want me to bring? No, just yourself. Thank you Mr. Paxton for giving me this opportunity. I won't disappoint you. I'm sure you won't Cheryl. I'm sure you won't. La Chateau is one of the fanciest restaurants in all of Boston. The fact that it's in one of the many glass and chrome high-rises in the middle of the business district doesn't make it any less discriminating. I remember thinking as I walked to the table where Brad sat waiting for me that I'd have to invite Marty here one day. My dear husband works way too hard and inviting him to a fancy lunch would be a nice treat. Maybe I can even convince him to leave work a little early for some of good loving at home afterwards. Brad already had a bottle of wine opened and poured a glass for me as I sat down. We talked a bit about the responsibilities of the logistics supervisor before ordering lunch. I tried to keep the price to something reasonable, but Brad insisted I splurge. It's on the company tab, he reminded me. While we ate I talked about me. I told him about my husband, my education, even what my ambitions and dreams were. After dessert we sat back to enjoy another glass of the fine Merlot, and by then I think I told him my entire life story. Cheryl, we've talked a lot today about your ambitions and your dreams, but you've never said what you were willing to do to get my recommendation. I only want what's best for enterprise and will recommend the best person for the job, whoever that is. But what can you do to tilt the odds in your favor? What will you do to make you stand out in my mind? I don't know what more I can do than show you that I'm a hard worker and… No, 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 I don't mean stuff you put on your resume. I mean personal things. Like what? I asked. I hadn't really caught on to his train of thought. Well, you were willing to have lunch with me today. How about next Monday we have lunch to continue our discussion? Okay, I can do that. And I want you to think about something. Next Monday, I want you to answer this question. Are you willing to do anything I ask to get this job? I mean anything. Don't answer now, just think about it, and let me know Monday. I think the right answer may be what tips the scales in your favor. Just think about it, and we'll talk. Waiter, check please. It wasn't until I got back to my office that I fully realized what he just asked. I mean anything he said. His anything meant only one thing, sex. I had to decide if Brad's anything was worth the risks and the gains. I didn't get any work done the rest of the day thinking about it. I thought about it all weekend too. I'm sure Marty saw how down my mood was. Even at night when we made love I wasn't my usual energetic self. Oh, we had great sex but it wasn't our usual falling off the bed two-person fight. It was slow and gentle and loving. Marty's the best lover I've ever had. Well, I've only experienced three other men before him, but he's by far the best. 
Maybe not blessed with the biggest tool, average from what I gather, but he's the most caring and loving man I've ever met. I weighed the pros and cons of cheating on him to get a promotion at work. By Monday morning I had gone over every aspect, every risk, every contingency in my mind and felt pretty good that I could separate my work life and my personal life enough to get the promotion. I had a plan, if Brad would agree to it. And, I rationalized it was only temporary until the job was mine. When we were at lunch on Monday I came right out and asked if what he said was what he meant. Did your, I mean anything really mean what I think? I asked. Are you asking that we get together outside of work for a little romp in the hay? Whoa, before I answer, I need to ask you a couple questions first. Are you recording this conversation? No, why would I do that? Okay, then who have you discussed our conversation with? Nobody. Okay, then I'll answer your original question. Yes, I want the two of us to get to know each other a lot better, on a physical level. I want to do things with you that I've only fantasized about when you sat in my office. I want to hold you and run my hands all over your sweet body and watch your face. Does that answer your question? About as well as can be answered, I said. And a promotion is contingent on it? I don't really want to come out and say that, but if you're nice to me then I'll be nice to you. Tit for tat so to speak. I leaned over and whispered in his ear, Okay Brad, I want this job, I really want this job. If it means sex with you to get it, I will. However, I do have a few conditions. First, we are never going to do anything after work hours. No dinners, no weekends together. No sneaking off to some sleazy motel for a few minutes. Whatever we do we do at work at lunchtime either in your office or mine. Even though we both have those floor-to-ceiling windows, nobody can see in since the window glass has a covering that makes it look like a mirror from the outside. We each have a desk and a couch and a lock on the door. It will be in our office and no place else. Second, absolutely nobody else will know anything about this. I mean no one. Third, when I say it's over, it's over. If I think of any other's conditions, I'll let you know. He sat back smiling. I agree, he whispered back. I think we should schedule a regular lunch meeting on Wednesday to discuss the progress of your work. Say, every Wednesday at noon in your office. Okay, just remember to lock the door when you come in. And it started. Our first time together was nothing to write home about. Brad may have been as nervous as I was. Absolutely better than any fantasy, he mumbled. We did it on the couch. By the time he was back to his senses, I was dressed and standing in front of him. He looked somewhat embarrassed as he stood and pulled his pants up. Finding his masculinity again, he took me in his arms and gave me a long deep kiss. When it was over he left without a word. So much for our first Wednesday status meeting. I sat at my desk for the longest time thinking about what I had just done. I had sex with someone who wasn't my husband for the first time since I got married. I started to cry. I just cheated on my husband. But I did it for something I've always wanted. Something I needed to prove to everyone that I was good at what I did. Getting that promotion would tell everybody that I really was a good worker. I needed that. Besides, there was no way Marty would ever find out. All I had to do was act naturally when I got home. I went to the ladies' room and cleaned up. While sitting on the toilet, I tried to think of ways to not feel guilty about being with Brad. If I didn't do something about the guilt then I might let something slip with Marty. If only Marty was mean or cruel, I wouldn't feel guilty cheating on him. But he's not. Marty is the sweetest man in the world. He's never done anything to hurt me or disrespect me and I know he loves me unconditionally. So why am I disrespecting him? For the promotion, of course. This promotion would be the biggest thing I've ever done and it would make everyone, especially Marty, very proud of me. Everybody would finally believe that I can accomplish great things on my own. So, I'm really doing this for Marty. He'll never know what I did to get it. I've just got to be careful. All I have to do is keep Brad's activities confined to the office and everything will be okay. I thought about what to do about the guilt for a long time sitting in that stall and finally came up with an idea. Maybe not the greatest idea I've ever had but still something workable. For the hour or so Brad and I get together I can pretend that Marty is mean to me and our marriage is in trouble. It would only be play acting but once Brad finishes then I can go back to reality and think about my wonderful Marty. A bit of a mind game? Sure, but I'm pretending to enjoy Brad screwing anyway so a little more acting wouldn't hurt anything, just so long as I don't feel guilty about what I'm doing. The next status meeting wasn't as awkward. I did remember to have that talk with him about condoms and diseases and the like. His answers seemed okay, and I silently agreed to forego the condoms. I didn't like them anyway. From there we proceeded to do just about every sex act. I made sure he left thinking I enjoyed it. Sometimes I did. Most times I didn't. One time just before Christmas Brad had me been over my desk when my phone rang. Since I happened to be right beside it, I looked at the caller ID. 
and saw it was Marty. I motioned for Brad to be quiet and answered it. He never stopped, but at least he was quiet. I picked up the phone and said, Hey babe, what's up? Marty's voice sounded happy when he said, I was just calling to let you know I'm leaving work a little early to do some Christmas shopping. I should be home around the time you get there, but if I'm not don't start dinner. I'll get something for us out. I needed to end the call quickly and finish up. Okay sweetie. I'll see you at home. Gotta run to a meeting. See you. For some reason I pointed my middle finger at the phone after setting it back in the cradle. As we dressed Brad asked me about giving the finger to the phone. I didn't know he saw me do that and for a second I didn't know what to say. Marty and I haven't been getting along too well lately, I lied. I was perturbed that he chose that moment to call. Hell, I was enjoying and he called. I guess it made me a little mad. Screw him. I guess Brad bought it but the more I thought about it after he left the more I convinced myself it was true. All except the part about us not getting along too well lately. Marty and I had been getting along fine. I was just mad he interrupted my sex session. Giving him the finger was a crude thing to do, and truthfully I don't know why I did it in the first place. Marty called a couple more times while we were together, and I gave the phone the finger each time. After a while it just became part of the play acting I did. I guess more out of frustration over Marty's poor timing than anything else. Two days later I received an email from Ambrose St. John, the man who was retiring soon and whose position I wanted. His message said he knew what Brad and I were really doing in our weekly status meetings and he wanted to talk to me about it, or he would have a talk with the board of directors. I called him up and asked him to come to my office. When he did he brought Brad along with him. What he said was quick and to the point. Mrs. Hughes, Brad, I know what's been going on in your office on Wednesdays. Don't lie to me and deny it. I have proof, photographic proof. Don't ask how I got it just be assured that I have it. I'll show it to you sometime. So, now you're asking yourselves what I want. I want to be a part of it. I want to be included in your little meetings. If not, I'll go to the board of directors and show them my pictures. I just sat there hanging my head. I didn't look at Brad. I knew what the old guy wanted. Maybe he didn't know the reason I agreed to start with Brad in the first place, but if he had pictures then any chance of my getting the promotion was out the window. They could even fire me. I looked up at him and said, what exactly do you want? He smiled a little smile, got up, closed and locked the door, then walked over standing next to me and said, let's start. I had no choice. The fat, white-haired old guy had me over a barrel. So I made sure he was pleased as well. That was very good Mrs. Hughes, he said walking to the door. Why don't you schedule a status meeting for just us on Thursdays? I think I'm available at lunchtime. And then he was gone. Brad and I looked at one another. I'm sorry, he said quietly. I don't know how he found out. What are you going to do? Hell, what choice do I have? I said, I want his job, so I guess I'll just have to meet with him on Thursdays until he retires. Brad shook his head then got up and left. Great. Now I had two office lovers. The week before Christmas my schedule started with Brad on Wednesday and Ambrose on Thursday. I found out after the crap hit the fan that Ambrose really didn't have pictures of us. He lied. By then we'd been having our lunchtime meeting for a while. When I thought about it I realized that he'd manipulated me into doing something I didn't want to do pretty easily. I guess that's what made him a good manager. Brad still left me unsatisfied even if he went away happy. Ambrose was a bit more forceful and always told me what he wanted and every Thursday was different. One Thursday at the end of January Ambrose showed up with a surprise. He brought along one of my other managers. I just stood there looking at the two of them as Ambrose talked. Mrs. Hughes, Cheryl, I've been telling my good friend Tom how good you. He didn't believe me so I invited him along to see for himself, and I told him how good you looked without that fussy business suit on. So why don't you start today by giving us a little show and take off those clothes? Since this is my time I'll go first. After I am done, then you can take care of Tom. I stood there not knowing what to do. Having another manager know I was having sex for a promotion wasn't what I wanted. But the old fart said he had pictures of me and Brad and I couldn't risk having them sent to the board or they'd most likely fire me. If I lost my job, then the cheating I did would go for nothing. I was stuck and I knew it. So, what's the old saying, in for a penny, in for a pound? But I didn't know what to do with Tom standing there. Mrs. Hughes, I asked you to do something, Ambrose growled. Remember the pictures? Like a trapped animal, I just stood there wondering how deep the hole was I was digging. I reached up and started to unbutton my blouse. Ambrose punched Tom in the shoulder and smiled. They took turns and now I had three lovers. The week started again and all day Monday I thought about what I was going to do Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for lunch, particularly Tuesday. And I wasn't disappointed. When Tom showed up on Tuesday, I found I wanted him more than I've ever wanted a man before, almost as much as my husband. 
We kissed and he ran his hands all over me. Tom was gentle and caring and I found myself enjoying his body. He was a beautiful man. His body was tall and firm and well-toned. He took me to heaven. Tom was an expert lover, gentle and caring in his love making. It was making love. Brad and Ambrose screwed me but Tom made love to me. When we finished dressing, I found I couldn't make eye contact with him. The guilt of what I had done had set in. Usually, it didn't hit until after they were gone but I was on the verge of tears standing there in front of him knowing I just made love to someone who wasn't my husband. And make no mistake about it, we made love, we didn't just screw. That's why I felt so guilty. He must have known what I was feeling because he came over and put his arms around me hugging me close to his body. I started to cry into his shoulder. I didn't hurt you did I Cheryl? He asked. I started to smile. He didn't know why I was crying. I hurt myself by starting down my own personal path of destruction. I'm okay, I said. I'll see you next week. When he left, I sat back and thought about the past hour on the couch with him. I alternately smiled and cried. But the crying won out. After a while I couldn't stop crying. On Wednesday, Brad screwed me. On Thursday Old Fart took me, which made me wonder if the two of them were talking and comparing notes. The three of us went on like that for a few weeks. One Friday they all came in unannounced and locked the door. That was the first time I entertained all three of them at the same time. That was also the first time I've ever had sex with more than one man at the same time. The only manager I wasn't doing on a regular basis was David Loretta. I couldn't figure out why he wasn't in the mix, and glad he wasn't, until one Monday he showed up just before lunch and sat down across from me. Ambrose told me about your lunchtime, status, meetings, and said you still have Monday available. Well, it's Monday and I'm here. So, show me what you've got to offer. When lunch was over, as I put my clothes back on, I thought about David. He wasn't anything spectacular. Now I had four lovers. When I got home that one evening I found that Marty left me a message he was going to his father's for the weekend. He's done that before so I didn't think anything of it. I just made dinner and watched a little television. I missed Marty. I always felt like something was missing in my life when Marty wasn't there. Like there was a hole in my heart the size of the Grand Canyon. Before I turned in. I took a hot bubble bath and fantasized about my husband gently making love to me. Wednesday my life ended. Brad and I had just gotten started in our status meeting. All of a sudden, a man in a cheap suit came in the door. I'm positive I locked that door but there he was walking in. Brad and I broke apart and quickly put everything back in our clothes. The man just stood in front of my desk with a little smirk on his face. What do you want? I yelled at him. Are you Cheryl Hughes? Was all he said. Of course I am. That's what it says on the door. Who are you and what do you want? He held out a large manila envelope to me. I looked at it for a long time and then took it. Madam, you are served, he said. He left with the same smirk on his face. I sat down heavily in my chair. Brad stood next to me looking stupid. I opened the envelope and pulled out the papers. On top was a petition for dissolution of marriage. I was so stunned I couldn't speak. Brad reached over and tried to take the papers from my hand, but I jerked back. I tried to hold on to them but between the two of us we scattered them all over the desk. There were several pictures there too. Face up? I could see they were pictures of my office and me and… Gingerly I picked up one picture in my left hand and another in my right. I looked at them and my life flashed before my eyes. One picture showed me extending my middle finger at the telephone. The other showed me having sex with Ambrose. How in the hell did he get? I never finished my sentence. I knew where they came from. I turned to look out the window. I saw another of the huge glass and chrome buildings across the street and knew whoever got these pictures got them from there. I ran to the window placing my hands on the glass looking at the building across the street. I'm sure that anybody looking back at me could see the look of absolute terror on my face. Right then I knew my life was over. My phone started to ring. I froze. I knew exactly who was calling. I didn't want to hear the voice on the other end but slowly inched my way over to the phone. Hello? I said with a sob. Tell Brad to leave. Marty growled. I fell back down in my chair holding the phone to my ear and letting my chin fall on my chest. Brad, go away. It's my husband. He started to say something that didn't make sense so I jumped up and screamed at him. Just get the hell out. He knows all about us a-hole. If I were you I'd get out of here and run as far away as I could. Marty may be an accountant but he can kick your butt from here to Sunday. Now get out. When he left, I sat back down and turned my chair to face the window. I sat there waiting for Marty to say something. Anything that would put me out of my misery. He said, Cheryl, you have to listen carefully and do exactly what I say. No arguments, no hesitation. You get one chance and one chance only. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. 
I said through my tears. I'm not messing around here, Cheryl. You get only one chance to save everything. Are you sure you understand? Yes, I whimpered. Good, now this is what's going to happen. First, you are going to quit your job. Second, you are going to file a sexual harassment lawsuit against each of your four lovers and against Enterprise as a whole. Third, you are going to explain to me why. Five minutes to do the first part. I hesitated and sat there silently sobbing. I was silent for a long time. Finally, I knew I had to say something. I chose the wrong thing to say. But Marty, I've got a lot invested in Enterprise. I'm going to be the first female manager. Hello? Marty? Hello, are you there? He hung up. I dropped the phone and flew to the window screaming and pounding on the glass. I have no way to tell how long I beat on the window before I fell to the floor sobbing. I destroyed everything. Marty knew I was cheating on him, and he was divorcing me. Oh my god, what did I do to him? I just lay in the floor wailing. I don't know how long I cried before I heard a knock at my door. I wiped my face as best as I could and went to answer it. Standing there was Ambrose with the most hateful expression I'd ever seen. And behind him I could see everyone in the office standing and looking at us. You stinking 304, he spit at me. Then he slapped me across the face knocking me to the floor. When I looked up Tom and Brad had him by his arms pulling him out of my office. I just sat there on the floor rubbing my cheek when one of the other account executives reached in to shut the door. Way to go witch, she said with a smile. Now I'm sure to get the promotion. See ya. How could everybody know about my divorce papers already? What's going on? I didn't understand anything except that Marty knew and was tossing me out. I started crying again and went back to my desk. I tried to call Marty back, but his phone just went a voicemail. I must have tried a dozen times and he didn't answer any of them. I only left him one message. Marty, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please call me back and talk to me. I screwed up big time and I need you to talk to me. Please call me. I'm desperate Marty. Please call me back. He didn't. As I sat at my desk crying and waiting for his call I saw my incoming email icon flashing. I had a new email message. Hoping it was from Marty, I quickly opened it. It said, watch what's going on in your office right under your noses. There was also an embedded video. I clicked on the video and the screen changed to me bent over my desk with Brad screwing me from behind. I couldn't move my hand to hit stop. I froze at the sheer horror of what I was watching. It was a video of me having sex with all my four office lovers. The video ended with the Looney Tunes Porky Pig cartoon ending, that's all folks. I slid out of my seat and onto the floor sobbing. When the two security guards came in, I never heard them. They helped me to my feet and told me that I had one hour to get all my personal belongings boxed up, after which they were to escort me out of the building. They also handed me an envelope with my termination letter in it. Somehow through the tears and the sobbing I packed up everything. As I put things in boxes I thought, nine years of hard work and dedication at Enterprise gone in a flash, without anything more than a slap across the face from one of my managers. I screwed up big time not only at Enterprise but with Marty. I needed to get everything in my car and get home to him. I needed to talk to him and explain everything. Maybe there was a chance to save my marriage. Marty was gone. He moved a lot of his clothes and personal items out and left me alone. There was a terse note on the kitchen table from him. It said, Cheryl, don't call me, don't try to find me, don't come to my work, don't do anything. If you need to communicate with me, call my lawyer. You have his card in the divorce papers. Sign them and let's get this over quickly. You've already screwed up enough lives. Marty, I was crushed beyond belief. I cried for two days straight hoping beyond hope that Marty would come back and forgive me. He didn't. I just sat in our home waiting to hear from him. Nothing. I read the divorce petition and it said, irreconcilable differences. He could have gone for my throat and said, adultery. So I guess that was his way of being nice. About a week after I left Enterprise, a lawyer called and said he was going to represent me in a sexual harassment suit against Enterprise. I don't know how he got all the information and the video and everything, but he had everything including all the email messages from Enterprise's email system. Marty must have put him on my case. Thinking I could get back with Marty if I did what he told me to do in the first place, quit my job, file sexual harassment charges against the managers and Enterprise, and tell him why, then maybe we had a chance. After the suit ended, then maybe he'd listen to me. He didn't. The lawyer was good at his job. I told him everything and answered every question about every intimate detail of our trysts. He sued each of the men and Enterprise for $1 million. After several meetings and one face-to-face -face with the lawyers at Enterprise we settled. They gave me just over $100,000 too, as they so eloquently put it, to put this dirty episode behind them. Enterprise fired three of the managers and Ambrose retired. 
also part of the settlement. After it was all over, I called Marty's divorce lawyer and told him I quit my job and filed sexual harassment charges against the company. Since I did everything Marty wanted me to do, I asked when we could get together to talk. He simply asked, why did you give the phone and Marty the finger? The question sent me back into hysterics. I couldn't say anything and hung up on him. I called him three more times, and each time he asked the same question, and each time I broke down. I finally gave up. After a month of being alone with my misery, I called my cousin in Cincinnati and told her about my problems. She said I should come out and live with her and look for a new job out there. Everything was gone in Boston, so a new start would be good for me. I thought about what she said for a week before signing the divorce papers and packing up my stuff. I left everything for Marty. I only took my clothes and a few keepsakes. Everything else I left behind. I left Marty a note on the kitchen table saying goodbye and begging him to call me at my cousin's number. He never did. I spent the first month alternately crying and contemplating self-harm. One day I was at my lowest point and I did try to end my life. Rachel found me and called the paramedics. They pumped my stomach and saved my worthless life. While in the hospital I was required to see a psychiatrist. We talked about what I did to get to this point in my life. She said she'd heard it all before and recommended another psychiatrist that I should see who specialized in grief counseling. She said a divorce is just as devastating as the death of a loved one and grief counseling would do me a lot of good. So I started talking with him twice a week. Eventually I came to grips with what I did and decided I really didn't want to die. I wanted to live again, but I wanted to live with Marty. My therapist helped me devise a plan. A plan to get my head on straight, to understand why I did what I did, and how to try to get my life back with Marty. But he was very cautious when he said I may never get it back. I knew deep down inside he was right, but I had to try. I received the final divorce decree papers four months after I left Boston. The property settlement gave me a lump sum of $100,000, and a check for that amount was enclosed. I got no alimony or any part of Marty's business or any of his retirement. I agreed to let Marty sell the house and split any profits. Two months of psychotherapy felt like a waste as I stood there sadly looking at the remnants of my previous life. So here I sit looking down at the ground, some 35,000 feet below, going over my screwed up life. I made some enormous mistakes, but I've also come a long way in understanding why, and I can guarantee they will never happen again. Hopefully when I get to Boston there will be a man there that will listen to my story and feel sorry for me. Maybe I can get my life back. Maybe he'll love me again. But then, maybe not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain. We're about 10 minutes out from Logan International Airport, and I've turned on the fasten your seatbelt sign so please return to your seats and, whoa, when did I fall asleep? The last thing I remember was the lady in the middle seat asking me if I was okay. That was embarrassing. I didn't even know I was crying. I tried to smile when I lied to her and said I was okay, but I don't think she believed it. She handed me a tissue and gave me a kindly look and said that, whatever troubles we have in this life, God watches over us. Just talk to him. That would be new. Sure, I've talked to my therapist, but all I got was a lot of stuff about low self-esteem and lack of confidence and narcissistic tendencies. Maybe it wouldn't hurt to have a little conversation with him. I thought when I boarded that reviewing everything that occurred in the last couple years would be helpful, but all it did was slap me in the face again with all the bad decisions I made, all the lies I told, and all the pain I caused. The misery I felt was as strong at 35,000 feet as when I experienced it a year ago. I reviewed. No, I relived the absolute worst time of my life and came up wanting. I thought I could find something that I didn't already know, something that would help prepare me for seeing Marty again. I found nothing. Everything was the same as it was before. I'm a liar. I'm a cheat. And I've ruined the lives of a dozen or more people. Why? Because I wanted to be a big shot manager. I wanted to be important. I wanted to be somebody. Now, I'm nobody. I'm Cheryl Smith. I used to be Cheryl Hughes but screwed that up. One of the conditions of my divorce was to never again use my married name, so I had to change it back to Smith. I think that hurt me more than anything else. I didn't want any alimony. I didn't want our condo. I didn't even want our savings. All I wanted was Marty. But that wasn't to be. I hurt him too much for anything I said. Any apology, any excuse, any explanation to cauterize the wound in his heart. I completely destroyed the man I loved and myself at the same time. I got my rental car and headed west on Interstate 90 toward my old home in Waltham. I'd driven the route to and from Boston a thousand times, but this time it seemed strange. I wasn't driving home. I was driving to my former home, the place where my ex-husband lived, where my former life was. A chill went down my spine. I felt like a stranger in a strange land. I also felt a stray tear plop onto my chest. 
with good traffic and a little luck, the trip would only take 30 minutes. Traffic was good and luck was on my side. And besides Saturday morning traffic was usually pretty light unless Boston College had a football game that afternoon. I pulled up in front of my old condo in 25 minutes, but I couldn't move. I sat frozen behind the wheel of my rental car too scared to do what I'd come a thousand miles to do. I sat there for the longest time thinking of the first words I'd say to Marty. Hi Marty, surprise. No, too flippant. Hello Marty, from the expression on your face you're surprised to see me. No, his expression might not be surprise but fear, or worse yet hate. Hello Marty, before you slam the door in my face, I want you to know that I came all this way to apologize to you. Not bad but don't give him any ideas about slamming the door in my face. Hi Marty, I'm here to apologize for everything. Can I take some of your time to talk to you? Well, that'll have to do. I should have spent my time on the plane thinking of what I was going to say to him, not reliving all the shit I did to him. I took a deep breath and walked up to the door. Everything looked the same except the azalea plants on each side of the walkway were gone. I got those for him when we moved into the house. He always loved those azaleas. The beautiful white blooms in spring always made him smile, and when he smiled so did I. I pressed the doorbell and waited nervously. Yes? The man said after he opened the door. This wasn't Marty. Where's Marty? The man holding the door open was tall and lean and appeared to be wearing only a plaid robe and slippers. He had half a smile, a friendly smile, and looked at me with a bit of caution. Who's at the door, Josh? Another man, a bit heavier and also wearing a plaid robe and slippers, came up behind the first and put his hand on the tall man's shoulder. Can we help you? The second man asked. I didn't know what to say. I expected Marty to be standing there and even prepared an opening line. Instead, two middle-aged men looking like they were just out of bed looked at me like I was some sort of nut. I, I, I'm looking for Marty Hughes, was all I could get out of my mouth. Oh, Mr. Hughes moved about four or five months ago, the second man answered. When exactly was that Josh? The first man, Josh was his name, replied, It's been more like six months now. He moved before Christmas. Remember we moved in after the new year, and the house had been vacant for a while. That's right, the second man said. Again my mouth and mind wouldn't work together. I just stood there with my mouth open. It took a few seconds but I stammered, I, I'm, I'm looking for Marty Hughes. The two men smiled and said in unison, You already said that. They turned to each other and laughed out loud and put their arms around one another. I felt my cheeks getting hot. I'm sorry, I said embarrassed. I'm his wife, well I used to be. I came here to, uh, talk and, I used to live here. He's, yeah we heard about you. Oops sorry, I didn't mean it like it sounded, Josh said. Randy, what was it the real estate agent said? Randy, the second man replied. She said the former owners went through a divorce and sold the house as part of the property settlement. She didn't go into any particulars except to say it wasn't friendly. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Josh said. Would you like to come in? Maybe have a cup of coffee and look around. We've made a lot of changes and it all looks fabulous now. Uh, no thanks. I think I'd better just go. You wouldn't happen to have Mr. Hughes' new address, would you? The two men gave each other a puzzled look. No, I don't think we do, Randy replied. We never actually met Mr. Hughes. We only worked with his real estate agent. Sorry. Thanks, I answered with as much of a smile as I could muster. Sorry to bother you. I turned and walked back to my car. When I got there I found another tear ready to drop on my chest. I drove away without a destination in mind. A little hole in the wall restaurant Marty, and I used to go to is where I ended up. I sat there drinking a cup of coffee thinking about what to do next. Marty sometimes worked on Saturdays so maybe I could catch him at his office. His office was downtown not too far from where I worked when I lived here. I hurriedly finished my coffee and headed back toward the airport and downtown. I had to drive past my old workplace and felt anxious about being there. The last time I was on that street was when I met with Enterprise's lawyers concerning my sexual harassment lawsuit. I was pretty messed up at the time and don't remember very much about the meeting. I do remember the names the lawyer called me and the sting I felt with each one. I parked in the parking garage next to Marty's office and entered his building. I don't think he's up there, the old security guard said. But you can go up and check. The door was locked and I could see through the glass part that there were no lights on. I noticed something different too. The door used to say, M. Hughes, CPA, and now it says, Hughes and Associates. I wondered what that meant. I sat in the car again thinking about where to look next. I didn't want to have to do it, but I knew one of his employees might be able to tell me where he was. If anybody knew Mandy would. 
I still had her name and address in my telephone directory as Marty's emergency contact for work. I keyed her address into the car's GPS and drove away. I felt a little hope as I drove. Mom, there's someone at the door, the young girl dressed in a soccer uniform yelled. I waited for the longest time before Mandy came out onto the porch and quietly shut the door behind her. What in the hell do you want? She growled at me, while dripping from every word. I'm looking for Marty, I said softly. I came to talk to him, to apologize. When I went to our house, he wasn't there anymore. I came here knowing you'd know where he was. Do you have his address? Yes, I have his address, but it'll be a cold day in hell before I give it to you. How dare you show your face around these parts again? What's the matter? Didn't you cause enough pain and suffering when you were here the last time? Coming back to see if you could finish the job and completely destroy him? There's no way I'm going to let you hurt that man again. He's over you. He's moved on. You're just a bad memory, a nightmare that comes up once in a while to remind him how lucky he is now that you're gone. Just go away. Crawl back under that rock you came from. She turned and went inside slamming the door in my face. All hope of finding Marty disappeared. As I drove away I cried, really cried, loud and hard. I had to pull over into a fast food parking lot to try to regain my composure. I couldn't drive and wail at the same time. I must have filled three or four tissues before calming down enough to realize people sitting at the tables outside were looking at me. My body still shook and I couldn't think straight, but I slowly began to come down from my despair. I heard a tapping on the car window next to me. I rolled the window down a little ways. Are you alright miss? A gray-haired man asked. I sniffed and wiped my nose again. I'll be alright, I replied. I just had a really bad shock that's all. I'll be alright in a few minutes. Thanks for caring. The man walked back to one of the tables and sat next to a little boy, maybe 9 or 10 years old. He continued to watch me out of the corner of his eye but turned his attention to the little boy. His son, maybe his grandson, I thought. They looked so comfortable together. So happy. Shit. I said under my breath. Marty's dad. I knew exactly where to go next. Marty's dad would certainly help me to get in touch with Marty. Marty's father and I were always friendly even during the divorce and everything. Quickly I entered his address in the GPS and sped away. The drive was just over an hour. I knew the way without using the GPS but wanted someone to tell me what to do and which way to turn. My mind wasn't working very well at the moment. When I pulled up in front of his house I got a major shock. Right in the middle of the front yard was a large white for sale sign. I got out and walked up to the door. There on the front door handle was a real estate agent's lockbox and a note saying to call Ash Real Estate in case of emergency. Peering through the windows next to the front door, I saw the barewood floors and empty walls. The place was vacant. Marty's father no longer lived here. He too was gone. I sat down hard on the front stoop and started crying again. Most of my tears already fell after visiting Mandy, but still some new ones found their way out. This trip to find the man I still loved was turning out to be a bust. At every turn I was rebuffed. Marty may as well be on the moon if I couldn't find anybody to tell me where he was. My crying jag didn't last, and before too long I was looking around the neighborhood. Across the street was an old woman working in her garden. Maybe she would know something about Marty's dad. Mr. Hughes died three months ago, the little old woman said from the other side of the old picket fence. It was just after the new year I think. He had a heart attack and died right out there in his driveway. I understand he was under a lot of stress for some reason. He just succumbed to the pressure I guess. Sad. He was a nice man, quiet but nice. His son and daughter and a lot of their friends were over there cleaning out the place. They're nice people just like their dad. They gave away a lot of what was in the house to the neighbors. They gave me a really nice set of porcelain figurines and his gas grill. Sad. Really sad. I walked back to my car in a daze. Luckily there weren't any cars driving by, or I might have been gone too. My trip was at an end. I flew a thousand miles to talk to the only man in the world I had feelings for, and I couldn't find him. At every turn I was defeated. I might as well go home. Right then and there I gave up. On the way out of town I stopped by the cemetery where Marty's father was buried. I wanted to pay my respects and say goodbye. I loved Marty's dad. He was a kind and wise man. He was the one who recommended that I get into some sort of counseling, find a psychotherapist and ask for help. I knew that he already had a gravesite waiting for him next to his beloved wife, Beverly. I walked up the hill and saw his name newly inscribed in the dark granite headstone. I couldn't cry. I was out of tears. Now when I wanted to cry I couldn't. I made myself a promise that when I get back home, I'm going to have that long talk with God. As I stood there looking down at the grave I saw a white wicker basket full of flowers leaning against one side of the headstone. There was also a card attached. 
I picked up the little card and read it. We miss you with all our hearts. Love always. Brenda and Marty. The flowers were from Marty and his sister and the handwritten inscription on the card was from a local florist. The florist was on the way out of town, so maybe if I stopped by and asked nicely they might give me Marty's address. They were my last hope. The young man in the florist shop came away $100 richer and I came away with Marty's address. For the first time in days I smiled. I knew where Marty was. I was going to see him after all. I gave up too soon. The GPS led the way and I followed knowing I was going to see him. The trip took an hour and a half from what the clock on the dash said, but in my mind, it was only minutes. I pulled up in front of the address the florist gave me and saw a pretty white bungalow with blue shutters. On the front porch were two wicker rocking chairs and a small wicker table. The lawn was neat and the bushes around the porch trimmed. The mailbox out front said Hughes so I knew I found him. There was a driveway but no car. With a sense of dread thinking he wasn't home I walked to the door and knocked. Nothing, no answer, he wasn't home. I stood there forever. There was no answer. I was crushed. For what seemed like the hundredth time that day I sat down and cried. So close, so close. I lamented. But I was determined to wait for him. If he wasn't home by dark I'd go, and find some place to stay for the night, and come back in the morning. Until then I was going to sit in his rocking chair and wait. After an hour or so I got bored and started walking around the house. I saw Marty's touches everywhere. The two azalea bushes from our old house stood proudly in the middle of a rock garden out back. In the center of the garden stood an antique-looking sundial with the inscription, Grow Old Along With Me. The best is yet to be. Marty said that Robert Browning's quote was his favorite romantic saying. On the deck was the gas grill he bought just before. Well, just before the end. I could feel Marty everywhere. I could almost smell his aftershave. I stood on the same grass he did. I breathed the same air. Enjoyed the same sunshine. It felt wonderful. But Marty wasn't there. I had to be patient. I'd see him. Eventually, I wandered back to the front porch again and stood there looking around at everything. The house and the entire neighborhood looked exactly like the house Marty talked about buying when we decided it was time to have kids. The color of the house was perfect, the front gardens were perfect, the other houses in the neighborhood were perfect, even the little kitty park down the street was perfect. Everything was exactly as Marty had described it, his ideal place to raise a family. This was to be our home when we had kids. But, but, it wasn't ours. It was his. I'm no longer part of his life. Sometime later I wandered down to the little kitty park and sat at a little table made in the shape of a giant green turtle. I thought about everything Marty and I talked about when we had kids. He had so many plans and knew exactly what he wanted. He even knew how many children we were going to have, two, a boy and a girl. I think he even had names picked out already. But I screwed it all up with my ambitions and my stupidity. Now we would never have children together, nor have the little house in the suburbs, nor would we live happily ever after. But if Marty came home and I explained to him how sorry I was and how much I still loved him then maybe he'd forgive me. Then maybe there would be a happily ever after. This time there were enough tears. My head fell to the table buried beneath my arms and I cried. Deep body-racking sobs came from my chest. I stared into a bottomless pit and wailed. And for the hundredth time I wanted to die. Without Marty my life wasn't worth living. Oh God how my heart ached. In midst of all my tears, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I wiped my eyes on my sleeve and turned. There he was. Marty was standing behind me with his hand on my shoulder. He had a sad smile on his face, but he was there. I jumped up from the little table and threw my arms around his neck and hugged him like he was going to fly away at any moment. I cried into his neck. I said his name over and over again. I told him how much I missed him and how much I loved him. He just held me and let me cry into his neck. That's when I saw the others. Standing at the edge of the little park were three women. I recognized Mandy and Adriana but didn't know the young Asian woman. All three were standing there with their arms crossed over their chests, and if looks could kill then I'd already be on my way to the afterlife. Hi Cheryl, Marty said in my ear. Would you like to come in? I just held him tight, afraid to do anything to break the spell. I found him again and was never going to let him go. Never. Come on, he said. Let's go inside. He pried my arms from around his neck and took my hand in his. Slowly he started up the hill toward the others pulling me behind him. We walked back to his house hand in hand while the others followed a discreet distance behind. Nobody said anything. When we got inside he let go of my hand and told me where the bathroom was. I realized that I hadn't gone to the bathroom since I left the airport. While in there I took a moment to wash my face and put on fresh makeup. I looked pretty bad from a full day of crying. He was standing outside the door when I came out. Let's go out onto the deck, he said quietly. 
I have a lot to tell you, and assume you didn't come all this way for my cooking. You probably want to have that talk we never had. I think it's time. Come on. The three women were working in the kitchen preparing something to eat as we passed through. Nobody said anything to either of us. We just quietly walked out the back door and onto the deck as they continued to stare bullets at me. We sat for the longest time in complete silence, only glancing at the other in hopes that someone would say something and break the eerie tension. I don't think either of us knew where to start, or for that matter how. I wanted to tell him how so deeply sorry I was. I wanted to confess all my sins. I wanted to lie prostrate on the deck, kiss his feet, and beg his forgiveness. I wanted to tell him how much I still loved him. I wanted to tell him everything in my heart. But I didn't know how to begin. I came a thousand miles to see him, and now that I was sitting across from him I couldn't say anything. How have you been Cheryl? He asked. I'm better now Marty. How have you been? Good. But I don't think you came here to exchange platitudes. Why don't you tell me what's been going on in your life since? He trailed off looking down at his hands. I opened up the floodgates and let everything fly. Marty, I don't know how much you know so I'll just tell you everything but give you just the highlights. The sexual harassment suit against Enterprise settled between the lawyers. We didn't have to go to court or arbitration. They gave me a decent settlement, and with the money you gave me I had enough to move to Cincinnati and start over. My cousin Rachel helped me out a lot. You remember Rachel? She was at our wedding. She was the one with the limp. Anyway, she found me a place to live and helped me find a new job. I'm working for a software company teaching customers how to use our systems. It's a good job and the people there are nice. I've been seeing a psychologist ever since I left Boston. He's helped me to understand why I did what I did. The most important thing I learned was that everything, and I mean everything, was my fault. You did nothing to cause any of this. I'm to blame. You were just an innocent bystander. I know I said I'm sorry a thousand times to you before our, our divorce, but I meant it every time I said it, and I mean it now. I'm so, so sorry for everything I did to you, and to us. I know words can't change what happened, but I want you to hear them anyway. I'm sorry Marty for everything. I was pretty messed up for a long time after you found out. I even tried to kill myself once. Sadly, I was even a failure at that. My therapist told me that it was a desperate act aimed at getting your attention. It probably was, but I didn't do it to heap more pain on your shoulders. I was just trying to get out from under my own. But you never knew what I did. Rachel never called and told you. Like I said I was a real mess. I didn't think killing myself would hurt you. And, the stuff I did with the managers at Enterprise was something else I didn't think would hurt you. I thought if you didn't find out then it wouldn't hurt you. Boy was I wrong. I never realized how much I hurt myself which in turn hurt you. My therapist also told me something that I never knew but looking back at my life, I know he's right. He said I have little confidence in my own abilities and low self-esteem. That means I believed I couldn't be promoted on my own merits. That's the main reason I did what I did. Having sex with Brad would guarantee a promotion. I learned afterwards that the CEO had already talked to the board about promoting me. I made an incredibly bad decision to start with Brad, and it got out of hand with the other three. I'm not going to give you any bullshit excuses and say I was coerced into it. I went into it on my own free will. I thought it would stop when I got promoted. I didn't think beyond the promotion. Marty, I don't know how you found out and don't really care. All I know is you did. When you sent everybody in the company that email with the video of me and the four managers I was devastated. I wasn't hurt because everybody saw me having sex with someone. I was hurt because you were so crushed you wanted to hurt me back. I deserved it. I know that now. And I would have accepted any punishment you wanted if you only heard me out and listened to my apology. But you didn't. When your lawyer said you refused to talk to me and never wanted to see me again I went a little crazy. I destroyed the only man I've ever loved and will ever love and you wouldn't talk to me. And God what I did to the families of those men. Did you know that three of them got divorced because of what we did? The fourth one's wife said she could make him more miserable married to him than by divorcing him. I imagine she's doing just that. Marty, I helped ruin four families, no five including ours. Their wives and children didn't deserve this. You didn't deserve this. All because I wanted that job. When I filed the sexual harassment lawsuit, Enterprise fired three of the men and the fourth retired. I don't know what happened to them because I haven't spoken to any of them, but I'm positive I messed up their lives too. That's more than a dozen people devastated because I was ambitious. The lies I told you were hateful too. To cover up what I did I lied about everything. Believe this Marty. I never lied to you up until that point. Since the day we were married, I always shared everything with you. Then the lies started. I started with Brad and lied to cover it up. For that I'm truly sorry. I hope someday you find it in your heart to trust me again. If not I'll understand. 
I just want to say a couple more things before I start crying again. I hope you believe me when I tell you that all the sex I had with those men didn't mean half as much as one night in your loving arms. It's a cliché I know, but they used my body for sex. With you I made love. I never did anything with them I didn't do with you. I never enjoyed what they did half as much as what we did. Three of them used me for their own pleasure without any regard for my feelings. One was kind and giving. I have to tell you that I enjoyed being with him, but it wasn't the same as being with you. And most importantly of all I never once told them I love them. I told them a lot of other bullshit, but I never said, I love you. I only said that to you, and always meant it. And as God is my witness I love you, as much now as I ever have. The last year has been hell for me. Not having you in my life made me half a person, and I guess it was equally difficult for you. But Marty, I'll do anything to get you back. I'll accept any punishment, take any conditions you want, make any sacrifices. Tell me what you want, and I'll do it. It doesn't matter what, I'll do anything. If you want me to fall down on the floor and kiss your feet, I will. I you want to humiliate me publicly in front of family and friends I'll gladly stand there and take it. If you want to get your revenge by having sex with other women while I sit there and watch, you can. Do anything you want, just let me back into your life. Please, I beg of you. I started sobbing and couldn't finish. Marty sat quietly for the few minutes it took get control again. I'm sorry. I said I wasn't going to cry until I finished. Marty I'm sorry to hear about your father. He was a great man and I will always remember him warmly. I stopped by your parents' grave to pay my respects. That's how I found out where you lived. Please accept my apology for letting you down. If you can find it in your heart please forgive me for everything I've done. And if there's any feeling for me left inside you please tell me you love me again. More than anything else in this world, I want to come back to you. I want to be Mrs. Marty Hughes again. I miss you and pray that you will take me back. Please Marty. I love you. I put my hands over my eyes and let the tears start again. The whole time I talked Marty sat in his chair and listened. He didn't move and he didn't say anything. I only occasionally glanced up at his face during the whole time I spoke. I didn't have the guts to look him in the eye. I can't tell what he thought. Excuse me, Adriana said poking her head out the door. If you want something to eat we're about to put dinner on the table. When you want to take a break come on in. As quickly as she appeared, she disappeared. Would you like to take a break? Marty asked. We can get a little something to eat if you want. A while ago I realized I hadn't gone to the bathroom since I left the airport, and I now realized I haven't eaten anything either. I'd like to clean up a bit first if you don't mind, I said wiping a tear off my cheek. Marty escorted me to the bathroom again, and afterwards to the dining room. When we walked in I saw that there were now five people sitting around the table. A tall red-headed man and a slightly frightening looking young woman with jet black hair and a number of piercings and tattoos had joined the three women while Marty and I were outside talking. While we all sat quietly eating everybody studied every move I made waiting for. I don't know what. Dinner was hell. I wanted to hear Marty's story and sat playing with my food hoping he'd say he loved me too. Waiting to hear him tell me he wanted me back was pure agony. After dinner, everybody took their dirty dishes back to the kitchen and just stood around in an uneasy peace. It was when Marty excused himself to go wash up that the group changed. Mandy and Adriana cornered me by the refrigerator and got nose to nose with me. Mandy glared at me and said, I want you out of here just as soon as you've said what you came to say. I told you that I wouldn't allow you to do anything to hurt him and I mean it. If I have to drag you back to whatever trailer park you came from by God I'll do it. Adriana chimed in after Mandy finished. Yeah. If that man so much as sheds a single tear over anything you say or do today, I'll find you and stomp you into the ground. Marty's our friend, and we don't want to see him hurt any more than he already has been. Begging for forgiveness and asking him to love you again will just hurt him more. He's in a better place now and has moved on. Forget about him and go back home. You threw him away. I looked around and saw the other three standing and watching. The one with all piercings was smiling at me in a way that immediately gave me the creeps. I just wanted to run and hide. Then Marty came back and saved my hide. Cheryl, let's go back outside and finish our talk. I'll bring us something to drink. I walked out the door and stood on the deck watching everybody through the window. At one point the little Asian woman said something to Marty and he smiled. That was the first smile I've seen on his face for a very, very long time. I missed it a lot more than I could have imagined. It hurt me to see someone else put it there. Marty brought out two bottles of water and when we were back in our seats he began. Cheryl, I appreciate your candor today telling me about what's been going on with you since, well since everything fell apart. I sense a change in you. Maybe you've grown. Maybe you've confronted your demons. Maybe you really do understand the consequences of your action. 
Whatever the case I want to ask a question that I really need an honest answer to. Then I'll tell you about me. After that we can talk about us. Cheryl, my lawyer asked you a simple question several times that you wouldn't or couldn't answer. He said that each time he asked all you did was break down in hysterics. I don't want to hurt you but I need an answer. Without it I think our little talk is over. Okay, here goes. Why did you give the phone, and me, the finger when you hung up after talking to me when you were with those guys? I knew he was going to insist on an answer to that question, and I think I was now ready to tell him. Marty, I've done a lot of stupid things in my life, but I think giving you the finger was probably the stupidest, at least it was the crudest. My therapist and I talked about it a lot, and I can tell you now the reason I did it. There's no simple answer, and it's not just one thing, but the main reason I did that was because I was trying to convince myself, and the man who was with me at the time, that you were a rotten, no good husband. In my mind I believed that if you were bad to me then I wouldn't feel guilty cheating on you. Boy was I wrong. I felt guilty as hell every time I touched one of those guys. I thought that by play acting that you were evil than I wasn't. Again I was wrong. I was the bad guy in this story. You were just an innocent bystander. And by letting the man I was having sex with see me, do that then they believed that you were useless and my marriage was meaningless. All stupid ideas in retrospect but that's what I was thinking. By giving you the finger I was saying you didn't matter. But whoever was with me did. It was a bald-faced lie, and it came back to bite me big time. I never meant it. I didn't want you to screw off. It was just some bullshit play-acting thing to cover my guilt. I'm sorry I ever did it, and I'm more than sorry you ever saw it. I apologize for ever doing it. I watched Marty's face as he digested my explanation. Every word I said was the God's honest truth. I was just play-acting. I didn't mean to disrespect him. I thought at the time it was harmless. I couldn't have been more wrong. Okay. I can see what you're saying. You did it to help lessen your guilt. I can understand that. Cheryl, I believe you're being honest with me, now. To tell you the truth, that one little action hurt me more than just about everything else. The sex and the lies were bad enough, but that single act of disrespect tore me in two. I think that was the thing that made any chance of getting past what you did impossible. I still have flashes of memory seeing you do that, and it still hurts like hell. Is that why you wouldn't talk to me, because I didn't answer that question? Well yes, but only partly. I think I used it as an excuse to not talk to you. I was so mad I didn't want to do or say anything that would hurt either of us, and I certainly didn't want to go through all that pain again. It took my friends a long time to get me to the point where I could even talk about you. Seeing you here today is pretty difficult. We sat back and took a drink of our water pausing to catch our breath. Okay Cheryl, like you did I'll give you the abridged version of my life over the last year. When I hit enter on my computer and sent out all those emails with the videos of you and your lovers I was mad, madder than I'd ever been in my life. So mad I could have killed somebody and that somebody could have been you. Mandy said I looked calm on the outside, but inside there was a giant volcano erupting in my heart. I wanted to hurt you. Hell I wanted to hurt everybody. I knew I would destroy everything that you had built up with your job but I didn't care. Taking away the things you loved was the best revenge I could think of. And yes that included me. I just wanted you to hurt as much as I hurt. And emailing your supervisor's wives was my way of getting revenge on the men who took something from me. They took my wife from me and helped to destroy my marriage. Oh, I blamed you for being a part of it, but they were just as much to blame. I struck out at everybody and everybody paid dearly for it, including myself. Over the next couple months, I got threatening phone calls and emails, some from enterprise employees and some from friends of your four lovers. I talked to the wives of those men and tried to apologize, but they were too hurt to listen. One even spit in my face. However, all four did take a copy of the raw footage to help in their divorce cases. I stayed at my dad's for a couple months, trying to get my head on straight. He was great and gave me a lot of beneficial advice and helped me to calm down and see things for what they were. After a few weeks I saw in his eyes the same stress I felt. I stopped talking to him and started thinking for myself. By the time I got back home you were long gone. I didn't try to find you or call you or anything. I was glad you were gone even though there was a hole the size of the Grand Canyon in my soul. I think I cried for three days straight before my little group of associates came over and said they were doing an intervention. It took a whole weekend but at the end of the second day I was laughing again. Afterwards Mandy and Adriana were like mothers to me. They told me what to do, when to do it, and when to get it done. I needed that. Yin stayed with me night and day making sure I ate properly, got enough exercise, and made sure things at work didn't get messed up. Even Jackie came by once in a while. She kept trying to convince me to get a tattoo, but I refused. Later she said she knew I wouldn't. She was just trying to get me out of my comfort zone of suffering and back to reality. I had become too comfortable in my sorrow. 
One weekend Red brought over a bunch of action DVDs and pizza and beer, and we had a man's night and that lasted two whole days. Yin really got on my case for leaving pizza boxes and empty beer cans all over the living room and for not taking a shower all weekend. All in all it was rather cathartic. I wallowed in self-pity for about three months before I woke up one day and started living again. The first thing I did was put our condo on the market. You'd sign the divorce papers by then so I had no reason to stay there. Too many memories. It took several months to sell, the housing market being the way it is, but by the time it did I was already living here. I understand a nice couple bought our old place. Anyway, my moving here was a new start. It was a break with the past, and I needed that more than anything. When I received the notification that our divorce was final, I started to slide back downhill. Yin stayed by my side until I found my way back. From that point on I've worked harder than I ever have before. Stayed around the house working on my little bungalow, and spent as much time with my friends as I could. They were my rock. I don't know if I would have survived without them. Oh, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but my little video of your activities showed up on an amateur spicy site about a month after I sent it to everybody. Red found it, but I didn't ask him how. I didn't post it there, honestly, and I'm sorry that it got out. I don't know what you can do about it, but I'll give you the URL anyway. I put the proceeds from the sale of the house in the bank and your half amounts to just over $22,000. I'll write you a check tonight. Sorry I haven't sent it to you before now, it's just that I didn't want to face you. Cowardly of me I know. Now before dinner you asked me a couple things. I think I can answer them now. I've been thinking about them for a long time anyway. You asked me to forgive you. Cheryl, I forgive you. I forgive you, but for totally selfish reasons. I can't be carrying around all that hate for you so, by forgiving you I purge myself of those feelings. Cheryl, I no longer hate you. However, I don't love you anymore either. Sure I can't forgive you but I can't forget what you did. Believe it or not those couple times I watched you with your lovers destroyed every good memory you and I ever created. Gone were our hopes and dreams too. It's all gone Cheryl. Every good memory, every good feeling, every plan we ever made. It's all gone. And the animosity I felt is gone too. Right now I'm a clean slate learning to trust and love and believe all over again. So I guess you see where I'm going with all this. Cheryl, I don't have any feelings for you anymore. The love is all gone. At one time I loved you more than anything in my life. Now, there will be a Mrs. Marty Hughes, someday, but it won't be you. I can't look at you without seeing you bend over your desk with some guy behind you, and I can't look at you without seeing you giving me the finger. I'm sorry if that ruins any hopes you had of reconciliation, but I can't go back. That part of my past is too painful. I'm moving forward, without you. I was devastated. I just sat there and sobbed. My life was over. I was never going to be with the love of my life. Oh God, oh God, why me? I murmured to myself over and over and over. Marty got up and brought me a box of tissues and then left me alone to cry. When I looked up minutes later, I saw him in the kitchen surrounded by his friends. The little Asian woman had her head on his shoulder. Now I understood what they meant when Mandy and Adriana told me he had moved on. I was the past and his new Asian girlfriend was his future. I sat and cried until the daylight started to fade. I composed myself enough to walk through the kitchen and go to the bathroom. I did my face again and put on a brave demeanor before going out. Everybody was standing in the living room talking to Marty. When he saw me he held out an envelope. This is your part of the sale of the condo and I wrote the URL of the video on the back. Just like that it was over. My hopes of getting him back were gone. Also gone was the last shred of my self-respect. I had to start my life over but without him. Marty walked me out to my car. I held his hand one last time and softly said goodbye as I kissed the cheek of the man that I loved, yet destroyed. I opened the car door and stood there for a moment wondering if I had the courage to look back at him one last time. I found enough to turn my head. What I saw ended my life. Marty was standing on the curb with his arm around the waist of the little Asian woman and hers was around his. All in a line behind him were Mandy and Adriana and the tall red-headed man and the frightening girl with all the piercings. Each one of them had their hand out in front of them with their middle finger extended upward. The message was loud and clear. Screw off. Now I totally understood Marty's pain. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.